Hi, I'm Adesha Wajosh, and I'll be leading this course on how to package like a pro. It's about writing and producing news packages for international broadcast news media, a skill in high demand worldwide in the journalism profession. Unfortunately, it's hard to find good training, and that's why I produce this course to provide you with tips and tricks to help you get started or to perfect what you already know. In this course, you'll learn how to put together a new story and to become the go-to source for packages on the stories happening around you. Package Like a Pro will help you turn your news gathering hobby into a money-making gig. Corruption, impunity, and lack of accountability are responsible for Nigeria's underdevelopment. As citizens, we have a duty to report wrongdoings that endanger the well-being of the society. See something, say something, blow the whistle today. Report corruption and other wrongdoings confidently and anonymously. Send tips to AfricMill on tips at corruptionanonymous.org or call 0811-877-1666 or the Presidential Initiative on Continuous Audit PICA on 0909-806-7946. Tips can also be submitted to the following anti-corruption agencies, EFCC, ICPC, Code of Conduct Bureau, or the Nigeria Police. This message is from the African Center for Media and Information Literacy, AFRICNIL, with support of MacArthur Foundation. Hello, it is 11.30 a.m. in New York City, 4.30 p.m. in Nigeria. Wherever in the world you are, welcome to another edition of 90 Minutes Africa. My name is Rudolf Okonkwo. My co-host, Chido Onoma, is off today. Our guest this Sunday needs no introduction. He's a journalist with over 40 years of experience. He's the author of more than five books. He has taught in some of the most important universities in the world. His new podcast, The Offside Musings, is blowing up Apple, Spotify, and Audible. He just chaired the 2022 Akko Ken Prize Committee of Judges for African Writing. His latest work, Never Look an American in the Eye, is a staple for memo writing studies. He says that a story that must be told never forgives silence. Please welcome to the show, Professor Oke Ndebe. Okay, Professor Ndebe, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Dr. Damages. Uh, <laughs> should I say Rudolph? Okonkwa. Yeah, on this show, I'm Rudolph Okonkwa. Yeah, <laughs> but, but sometimes the, Dr. Damages will come out. We don't know where he comes from. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know we have the um, the unknown bishops now. So there are yes. characters coming out all over Nigeria. Now, welcome. We we have some serious things to talk about today. Yes. Um, the headlines in the newspapers. If you look at newspapers to today, Sunday, you see one of the headlines says. I challenge you to sit for one hour interview. That is Atiku challenging Tinubu to sit for one hour <laughs> interview as a proof that he's ready to be president, you know? So that's how our our democracy, our... That's where we are now. That's where we are. Yeah, <laughs> that's where we are, where we are. We are at the point where being able yeah. to sit down for a one hour interview is the proof that you yeah. can run a country. Yes, yes, yes. So have you been following the political... Uh, situation in Nigeria. I, I, I'm afraid I have been. Um, it's, it's not. How shall I put it? It's not the most palatable of vocations. But um, uh, decades ago, several decades ago, I made um, a pact with myself uh, to become a writer and to become a commentator on Nigerian politics, and uh, part of. Uh, what comes with that territory is that one has to monitor uh, political developments in one's country. Um, 
So I must tell you that um, I'm sure you feel the same thing is very painful, is sometimes traumatizing. Um, uh, in fact, I was just saying to somebody earlier today that it seems to have become a habit in Nigeria that in order to become the president of the country, you have to be broken in a profound way, uh, either mentally, psychologically, or physically. So going by that uh, sort of seeming uh, national tradition, uh, Tinubu, who is clearly enfeebled, who is clearly uh, in poor health, will seem to be the perfect Nigerian kind of president. Uh, because we have tended to elect people in office who then, whether it's, uh, uh, well, even those within the leg, like Abacha, uh, and in some ways, going back to even uh, Babangida, uh, uh, men who were already struggling with ill health, uh, presuming to run a country that is complex and dynamic and that really uh, ideally should be run by the most engaged, energetic, alert, and physically fit uh, men uh, or women. Mm -hmm. Now, now I don't know if you watched the interview that Atiku granted uh, at Rice TV. Um, that was... Um, yesterday or two days ago i write tv and and that interview um it was an opportunity for him to tell the country what he's going to give to the nation should he be the president but um most people who watched it didn't feel that he did a good job did you see the interview no i haven't watched it i've seen um snippets of um, news reports of that interview uh, but even so, I mean, I, I, I'm not surprised. Um, in, in a society that takes itself seriously and takes public leadership seriously, uh, people like Atiku and Tinubu would not present themselves to be leaders. Um, and so I'm not surprised uh, at, at Tiku does not have the requisite intellectual, uh, moral, and perhaps even physical stamina uh, to run a complex nation like Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is several decades behind where it should be, so we need uh, if anything, uh, first grade material, people who understand what leadership means, people who have a certain vision of society, a certain vision of how to transform society, and who have the can-do spirit to take on that task. And uh, Atiku just is in the mold of the typical Nigerian politician who aspires uh, to leadership simply because really there are no consequences to failure in leadership, right? Uh, everything is on the upside. You know, they end up making more money for themselves, more money for their uh, inner family and for their cohort and their friends and so on. And uh, they move on. They would have awarded themselves the highest national honor. And um, Nigeria is a place where memory lasts perhaps minutes. So... Uh, the moment you leave and uh, it's somebody else who takes over, Nigerians who uh, forget all the atrocities that you committed as, as a leader. And that's why all kinds of uh, really uh, mediocre uh, men and women, men mostly, uh, present themselves to, to run the country and to run the states and so on. So, so is there anybody running now that you think is uh, suitable? For that position well i famously said that nigeria is, is, is at a critical um uh, state in its evolution that i don't think anybody uh, who is elected 
is going to begin to make a dent. Um, so I have proposed in several columns as well as in my podcast that rather than hold the uh, national elections next year, that different sectors in Nigeria should get together and select Nigerians of distinction in various areas of professional life and of endeavor, and that these individuals should constitute an emergency interim government that should run the country for as long as it takes. I'm not saying one year, I'm not saying two years. If it takes 10 years, they should run the country because we don't have the foundations to start with. Something as fundamental as the constitution, the Nigerian constitution is, to put it mildly, a year year constitution, okay? Uh, so we need a constitution. We need to set up national guidelines. We need, by the way, to resolve the question of whether we want Nigeria as a nation to start with. Uh, there are some people, it's become fashionable for some people to say that Nigeria is not negotiable. Nigeria is eminently negotiable. Uh, any uh, collectivity, political collectivity, is negotiable. Okay, Nigeria has not served any groups in Nigeria that I can see. And there are some people who think that the northerners are doing well. Well, the few... Uh, select members of the northern elite are doing well, but so are the few select members of the Igbo political elite, the Yoruba political elite, the Ijo, the Fufu, the uh, Fufu, the Hausa, uh, Ethic, uh, and so on and so forth. But Nigeria as a concept and as a reality does not work for 99%, perhaps more, of Nigerians, right? So if Nigeria is going to work, then we have to define what does Nigeria mean, okay? So if you ask a Nigerian, what does Nigeria represent for you? They either would not have a clue, or if they have a clue, it's likely to be pain. It's likely to be trauma. It's likely to be that, that they experience Nigeria as some kind of menace, you know? So the police in Nigeria will harass you. If you're driving from Lagos to, say, Onicha, you know, you encounter the Nigerian police every mile, okay? You encounter the customs every two or three miles. You encounter the so soldiers at some checkpoints, and they can intimidate you, they can detain you, they can kill you, okay, and tell a story. So Nigerians don't have a sense of what their country means, apart from the pain that their country can cause them. So... So having said this, and some people's response to this prescription is, oh, you know, the constitution does not uh, give, room for that. give room for this. And I say to them, Nigeria does not exist. At any rate, the politicians who run the country do not run it according to even the imperfect, deeply flawed constitution that we have. So to say that the constitution doesn't allow it, is is actually laziness we yeah, need but, 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 hold on hold on I, li I like where you're going because people yes. people also raise this issue and they say how do you make that thing to happen you know how do you form what you call the emergency transitional uh, government or so how do you how do you begin and okay. who are the people that will be there wouldn't that be the same people mm -hmm. that are currently in the senate in the house in the you know mm -hmm. who will represent the people that are not the same people that are everywhere. Okay. Well, um, this is my vision of it, right? In Nigeria, we have professional groups. We have groups representing doctors, lawyers, journalists, labor, um, um, university teachers, okay, uh, architects, engineers, and so on. My vision is that Nigeria is broken on so many different levels, right? So you and I know of some states where governors have built bridges that only by God's grace, and we know that God's grace does not extend to, <laughs> to bridges, right? So if you build a bridge that does not meet the proper engineering uh, uh, quantities and so on, structural integrity, that the bridge uh, sooner or later, more sooner than later, is going to collapse, right? 
Um, so we need all the sectors and we need a sense. And I think that everybody in Nigeria understands now that the country is, is bankrupt. And when I mean bankrupt, well, I, I mean that it's, it's not just financial bankruptcy, which it is. As you know, the government now, the federal government borrows money to pay salaries. Now, it's going to get worse next year. It's like almost 100% of the country's earnings are going to go into servicing the country's debt. It's, it's already happening. Precisely. So, so, so a state, a country where all the resources available to the government go to servicing debt. And in order to pay salaries, the government has to borrow money. Can you see how ridiculous and absurd that is, right? So, so for us to pretend that there is a country that somebody will run to be president in is to fool ourselves. We don't have a country. And so really part of what we need to do is to signal to Nigerians that we want to explore the possibility of having a country. If we're going to have that country, like any entity that exists, we should treat this as the founding moment, really, or the refounding moment. But we've missed so many opportunities to found Nigeria. So all the professional groups should get together and bring out their best. They would know the country is bankrupt. So there's no point, you know, in every organization, people know the corrupt, inept people. Um, so if you ask engineer, the engineering association to bring out their best to be part of this interim government, they're not going to bring a fool who is perhaps didn't pass his engineering exam, but through bribing lecturers and so on. Doctors will bring out their best to create for the first time a healthcare system, to give a sense of what a healthcare system would be. Engineers will give a sense of what approaches we need to take to create infrastructure in the country, right? Uh, lecturers who present uh, people who will begin to think with the ideas of creating an educational system that is um, wholesome and that is productive. Otherwise, what we're doing is, is to recycle failure and disaster and tragedy and mediocrity. Let, let me push back because people yes. would say that uh, something like the Nigerian Bar Association, mm -hmm. they've been having elections and mm -hmm. the elections are not different from the election of the uh, political the Nigerian, yeah, yeah. Politics, yeah. Yeah. So that, that if, you, if you actually say to the Nigerian Medical Association to produce people that will um, go into a kind of uh, committee or, or government that you are proposing that it will be the same class of people that we match yeah. because because they see that as opportunity to to run the affairs of the country and they could uh, pay their way the way they normally do and to come out on top what what, what do you say to that that, that well, look, I'll, I'll tell you i uh, yeah i'm aware of that i'm aware that um uh, elections uh into the bar association uh the executive the executive of the bar association are rife with corruption. But here is the difference. Governments, government officials, over the years have taken an interest in who becomes the leader of the Bar Association, OK? Because they want the, bar, the leadership of the Bar Association to be on their side as they wreck the country, OK? So they. Government officials give the members of the Bar Association resources to run, right? But the difference now is that everybody understands the country is bankrupt. So I'm going into this committee. There's no money that you share. In, in, in other words, the, the other point that I want to make is that those who are going to be in this would essentially be volunteering their time. Yes, you will be paid a stipend to maintain you but you are essentially becoming taking a stake as a founder of nigeria for the first time nigeria has not been founded as chino Atibe told me decades ago in my first interview with him right mm. so so even the corrupt ones will not go because they would know that they are going there to come up with ideas for reforming the judicial system and most of these people who bribe to become 
president of the Bar Association or something, are bankrupt fundamentally of ideas. So when they know that they are going to go to a forum where I have the best engineers, the best technologists, the best doctors will be there, wrestling with the questions of how to reform different sectors of Nigeria. And if what they have is just uh, a sense of how to go and steal money, right? There is no money to be stolen. You are not going to be president. You are simply a committee of experts in different areas trying to build a country that is really absolutely, uh, you know, uh, wrecked. Okay, we have to go into so many things, but let me let me push a little bit more because people sure. say that uh, the national conferences we've had several ones, conference uh, Abacha, Buhari, whoever, uh, Jonathan or Basenjo. How is this going to be different from from those conferences? Okay, so the the national conferences we've always had, right, had the assumption. They didn't have the same kind of urgency. So the urgency that I'm pointing to now, right, is an urgency that we don't have. We have a shell. We don't have a country. So we have emptied Nigeria of meaning. Okay. Um, so so so, if you look at events in Nigeria, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of getting to to the to your question in a circuitous way, but imagine a country where law enforcement declares a man a terrorist who's killed people wanted. The same terrorist is being turbaned the Fulani leader of a community by an emir in the north. It's a public ceremony. It's attended by hundreds, perhaps thousands of people. And the security agencies in Nigeria do not go there to pick this man up. Okay? Imagine that in March of this year, people went to abduct people, abduct victims from a train station. Since then, most of those who, have, who were abducted are still unaccounted for. It, 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 do you understand? Then imagine a country where a young woman writes a note on a list app saying, hey, this list app is for education. You should not be posting about your religion. And she is killed. And people make a video of this bonfire, okay? And months later now, we haven't heard of a trial that has started of the perpetrators of that crime, right? We're looking at a country where on February 14, Valentine's Day, university lecturers started a strike. That strike continues today. In other words, there has been no... Uh, university education in Nigeria since February 14th. And this is not a once in a 10 year event, it's a once in two year event. Do you understand? Then you look at a country where you travel from Lagos to any part of the country, okay? And the roads are in terrible shape where I went to Nigeria December of 2020, stayed there for a month. I stayed with a relative in Antony. I was pleasantly surprised that he had electric power for 20 to 22 hours every day. And I was happy. Uh, in April, I returned and stayed with the same relative. Now he had power for two to three hours at the best per day. So this is a country where and our Basanjo administration spent $16 billion saying that we're doing power projects. And they, there was nothing to show for it, right? And nobody has gone to jail. Nobody has been held to account. So we don't have a country. Do so why, why, do you, why do you think it's an emergency? It may be an emergency for you, but I don't think that it's an emergency for a lot of people because they are not showing that it's an emergency. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me play a video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me play a video before we continue. Okay. Just a small okay. video. And you see okay. the reaction of people after watching this. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm begging you. I'm begging you. 
pray and make this part of your master plan. You be there and hear my story. I will be you and I will be you. But they, they are clapping for him. They are supporting him. They don't feel the sense of emergency. No, no, no they do. They, oh, they okay. do? I mean, oh, let, me, let me put it this way. Okay. Let me, I'll put it this way. Um, you know, we have no theater in Nigeria. In America, to have a good laugh, you, you go to a comedy store. Our politicians become our entertainment. But not only are they entertainment, they're also entertainment that would occasionally throw money up. And in a country that is dirt poor, if you're lucky, you snatch 100 naira, 200 naira, and you can buy a kara or, or ogi for your family for the next day. Tinubu is that kind of entertainment. It is when Tinubu, Tinubu can go and stage all this, uh, these events. To have a sense of the true feelings of Nigerians, you go back to a movement like NSAS. Okay? When NSAS was happening, youth in Nigeria were demanding major and perhaps even fundamental changes in their country. And that is what frightened the political leadership, and they decided to use brute force to mow down the youth. The true feeling, I can tell you, the true feeling of the generality of Nigerians is not reflected when they go to these events where sometimes they're able to drink a mineral or there's something distributed. Nobody goes to these events unless they expect to get something. People did not troop to Tinubu, expecting oh, Tinubu is going to give us a vision of how it's going to improve our lives, right? People don't go to articles rallies thinking that, right? Unlike in the First Republic when Zeke or Awo campaign, or, okay, or Tafa Belewa, there were people who believed, they were, these were politicians who, as flawed as they were, were able to articulate a vision. Some of them wrote books, which they really wrote. The books are not written for them by their speech writers. They really wrote these books. So don't be deceived that there are people who go to Tinubu. They are not, in a lot of ways, they think that they have no hope. So this is all they've got, okay? And so when they go there, I mean, so let me sort of tell you a little bit of what happens, say, in the Southeast. You know that funerals and traditional weddings have become extraordinarily spectacular events, okay? Um, you know, so people talk about befitting burials. There's a lot of money, there's a lot of expense, there's a lot to eat and drink. What I've been told is that if somebody has wealth that the community considers inordinate, that the community considers um inexplicable people will come to your let's say you lose a relative and you're doing a funeral people will come there ask for a bottle of beer drink half of it put, throw the rest away and ask for another bottle drink half of it and throw the rest away is there a way of revenging because they feel you have wealth that you did, did not earn okay so and people will come and pack food to take home they don't just come to eat Right? So part of that reaction is poverty. People are poor. So even if a thief, a well known thief, calls a meeting, people go because they have to eat. But the other thing is, once they have the opportunity and nobody is looking, that thief could be lynched, which is why these thieves, whether they are politicians or bureaucrats and so on, walk around with security around them. They really, Tinubu does not mix with people. Tinubu will not do an Obama event where he goes to the crowd and starts shaking, you know, uh, doing high fives. Okay. So there is this 
Yeah, people will shout back and you know seem to praise him and so on. But I can tell you that there is no love lost between okay. him and the people. Okay, Let, let's talk more about the emergency, the, the sense that this is an mm -hmm. urgent situation. There are people who feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and but they've, they've decided they've looked at the country they've looked at the country and they've decided that it's not working anywhere that they are mm -hmm. going to uh, pull out of uh, nigeria mm -hmm. so they, they you find them in the, the biafran movement the odua mm -hmm. movement in the west mm -hmm. and several other groups in uh, in that parts of the country so what's wrong with that that their position that they they are fed up with nigeria they could see the emergency you are pointing out and they feel like okay we want to leave it's not working for us and we can't we can't wait anymore you're you're muted can you unmute yourself please? you you muted yourself i think it's an accident okay okay yes 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 okay so for me i said earlier that i don't consider nigeria as sacred so nigeria is open to negotiation um and what that means for me is that nigeria could contract could become smaller by different groups living or nigeria could actually become bigger if, if part of cameroon through a plebiscite wants to join nigeria i welcome it right there is nothing wrong fundamentally with agitation for separation okay i actually think that it should be the rights of people to agitate to leave but also what i tell people is to, um, I once um, was in Boston for a conference where I spoke on the Biafra question. And I said to people, <clears throat> when you say that Biafra is the answer, what is the question? Okay? So I'm not saying Biafra is not the answer, but what is the question? Now, I lived as a child through the first Biafra war. And I know that there was a lot of energy and passion this desire by people to determine their own affairs. But I also know that in the midst of the war to achieve Biafra, that there was a lot of injustice in Biafra, okay? I happen to know that officials hoarded relief material that was donated by international agencies, hoarded them for themselves, for their friends, and you go to the market and see bags of rice and bags of beans marked not for sale, being sold in the market. It wasn't small time traders who went and got it. It was government officials, Biafran government officials who distributed these things to their, uh, to their fronts to sell for them as their own people were suffering. So the idea that if we became Biafra, everything, every problem will be solved. It's self-deception. So I, what I say to people is, if you want Biafra, that's fine with me. Provided you understand that when you create Biafra, you have to struggle to achieve a fair, equitable, just country. If you think that once they say Biafra, or they say Anambra becomes a country, or emo becomes a country, that oh, all the problems will disappear. I want people to recognize that when, you know, when the saying that Nigeria is a zoo, when that statement is made, I say to people, I can accept that. Nigeria as, as currently constituted resembles a zoo. But that zoo has been created by the political elite, who include Igbo people, Yoruba people, Anang people, ethnic elite, uh, Fulde elite, Hausa elite, it was not created by one group. And when people say, um, try to assign virtue to themselves, okay, I say to them, you, you are engaging in self-delusion. The kidnapping that happens in the Southeast is done mostly by Igbo people, okay? So suddenly, Igbo people have begun to do some of the things that we criticized in, say, Boko Haram, the kind of gruesome violence that we engage in, okay? The decapitation of people. 
So I want people to know that we have all been traumatized by Nigeria. So one option is to fight collectively across ethnic, religious lines to recreate Nigeria. Or, and I'm willing to accept this, to separate into our different units with, that would understand it. That when you retire to your different enclave, you still have to struggle in order to create a country that will be meaningful for you. If you think that Biafra is just going to be all bliss, uh, I have something, I have the Atlantic Ocean to sell you. Yeah, <laughs> but, but the people who, who support Biafra, they will say, or oh, they do the one nation, they will say, one of the, uh, the, the talking points that, mm -hmm. that is difficult to argue against is that they think mm -hmm. they can, within that Biafra or do, or do a nation, they can yeah. control their politicians, they can put them put them in check but within the nigerian context it's difficult because of the structure of things the federal power protects these political actors in in the uh in the regions that that they have no power to they actually point what someone pointed out the issue of Mulu Mili in the mm -hmm. east mm -hmm. uh it, it basically saying that because the federal government was not really involved in dealing with that they went in the local people went in and dealt with that Mm -hmm. So how do you fault that argument? That okay. So how fault it is? First of all, um, it's like a society can quickly devolve into uh, a kind of jungle ethic. Okay. So when people say uh, we can we can handle our local politicians, if we are Biafra, if, or if we are, you know, Duduwa land, or if, if Anambra state or Imo state now becomes a country, we can uh, neutralize our politicians who are errant. They have a fundamental misunderstanding of the way that power operates. Money is an important asset in the fight for political power in any community. So, so, if Imo state became a state tomorrow, uh, became a, a country tomorrow, Russia's will be far more powerful than a lot of people, uh, you know, would think, would imagine. He's got the money. Perhaps that money was stolen from Imo state, but he's got it. And once he's got the money, he can be dangerous. He can hire people who will beat up his political opponents. He can bribe electoral office, officials. Corruption is not going to disappear just because, uh, you know, a state has been miniaturized, okay? And at any rate, I think that what we have in Nigeria, what we have in our space, is what I call a moral and cultural crisis. I went to school at a time, and I'm sure you did too, when... My parents would not hear of some of the things that are practiced today. So today, a, a tradition called sorting is so commonly practiced in schools all over the country where parents will give their wards, their children, money during exam time to go and bribe lecturers. There are special centers, right? You know about it yourself. I knew about it just two years ago. This is called special centers, special centers, where parents pay for their children to go take exams because those centers will find somebody to take exams for your children. Or the invigilators will be telling the answers to children. It was unthinkable. I mean, my parents would have killed me if I went to them and said, hey, bring money. There is somebody, you know, I will bribe an, invest an invigilator and he will give us the answer. So my parents would say, why did we pay for you to go to school? Go and become something else, become a laborer or something, right? So we now have a cultural crisis. And part of that cultural crisis played out in the Bakasi movement in the Southeast, where our people said that there was some mystical way of determining who was an armed robber. So they said they would put a knife on the floor and they would ask you if you are a suspect to... Uh, jump over the uh, machete or something, and that if you are an arm robber, the, the machete will turn red. And they will decapitate a human being. Okay? So, 
that might be what we relapse into, you know. So, yes, we could go and start setting fires to the homes of corrupt politicians, but then we're not running a human society. We are running according to the ethic and rules of the jungle. So if we want a civilized society, if we want a society that has true democracy and that brings the fruits of development to people, we have to modernize our ways of thinking. We have to become more objective, essentially. You know, uh, we have to start saying if there's an election and there's somebody from our hometown who is running or from our home state or from our ethnic, ethnic group or from our religion, but we know that somebody else from a different hometown, from a different religion or state is better. We have to vote for that other candidate. But our people too many times will vote for our own man, even if it's worse. Okay, that, that brings us to a very good segment. Um, if you look at the political environment today, there is a uh, former governor of Anambra State called Peter Obi. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know him. Yes, and, um, very well. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people are putting him up as the hope, maybe the, the only hope in, within the political uh, system of today. What do you think about him? What do you, what, what is it that people outside a number of states probably um, see in him that people probably inside the states um, may not um, think they, that is there. Okay. Well, first of all, there is a, a kind of movement. There is a kind of... Um, OB has excited um, a lot of Nigerians, especially young Nigerians. Um, and I think that that's, the reason for that is understandable. Nigerians have never, have not, in a long, long time, perhaps after the 60s, Nigerians have not found a politician, a political leader, a political aspirant, who appears to have taught, who appears to think about the problems in the country and to uh, spell out those, those problems and to articulate in some way um, ways of addressing those problems. So B, you know, will tell you of the productive, uh, the, the capacity of, um, the, the productive capacity of, of energy in Egypt, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in this and that country. And then compared with Nigeria, you know, he will, so he gives figures and so on. So that's, so Nigerians see that as a breath of fresh air. We've always needed that, okay? So when the Nigerian politician, um, a typical Nigerian politician will say to you, in, a, in that very lazy repetition of a cliche, I want to be president, or I want to be governor, or I want to be local government chairman, in order to deliver the dividends of democracy, which phrase of Basanjo used, in his inaugural address uh, when he was elected. And so the Nigerians thought, oh, this is such an amazing phrase. So everybody, I want to deliver the dividends of democracy. And he said to them, how are you going to do that? I want to move the state forward or the nation forward. You know, so it's very lazy. And that's typically because most of those who aspire to leadership in Nigeria are ill-educated. They are lazy mentally. So B, when he talks about all these issues, excites Nigerians. And the OB comes across as a youthful, physically fit person. So there's this combination of a certain sense of intellectual vibrancy and physical fitness, right? Which would be a welcome departure from what we've had in Nigeria. Now, my problem with OB is that when he was governor in Anambra State, you know, I mean, he and I had a very um, testy relationship, you know, and I've, I wrote quite a bit about him. I thought it would be for a certain cult of personality, okay? That would be is extremely self-referential, 
And it's not a good thing in a leader. A leader should be able to identify men and women who have gifts that he's then going to delegate uh, uh, challenges to. Okay? When a leader presumes to know everything, that's actually a weakness. That's one. Obi also tends to overpromise, and Obi tends to, so you know, so Nigeria's problems are so deep and so fundamental and vast. So when you begin to give the impression that if you are made president, you'll solve everything, um, then I would say pause for a minute. Okay, you cannot solve everything. Nigeria doesn't have the money. I don't think the international community has the stomach to lend us the money. So it's going to be a lot of doing. Maybe if he became president, he, he, he would take the first one year trying to just stop the bleed. Okay, because somebody who is a, a military officer in Nigeria told me that about 75% of the country's oil uh, exploration is stolen. So by private individuals. Again, that's not a country. That's part of why I say we don't rush into an election. When, if a country, is, if even if people were able to steal 1% of Nigeria's oil production, that's a big crisis. But when it is more than half of a country's resources that's stolen, it, it, don't pretend we have a country. There's no country there, right? So to go back, to get back to OB, Another problem I have with OB is what I call the self-inflicted hypocritical wound, okay? When people don't ask you certain things, don't go stating things which may turn out upon scrutiny not to be true, okay? So famously, a few years ago, OB claimed that he, had only, he owned only one wristwatch. And so Nigerians went out there and found pictures of him wearing several wristwatches. Okay? So such things. Okay? He was a wealthy businessman before he became governor. So it would be fine and expected if he owned several wristwatches. So when you come out and want to create an impression of uh, being ascetic, and being self-disciplined and restrained, and you tell a fib, then people will begin to wonder, if you're lying to us about owning one wristwatch, what else are you lying to us about? So I would say to him not to hug the microphone so much, not to be there speaking so much, to actually create a network of people who would work for him begin to appoint advisors in different areas and some questions that are asked of you say go to this my go-to man that's who i have asked to look at the question of how to industrialize nigeria go to this other person that's who i have asked to begin to think about how to reform the educational sector don't be the one doing everything because when you do it you over promise you get into fibs into falsehood you get into unnecessary unforced errors and um so so but having said all of this i think that clearly of the three major candidates tinubu atiku and obi i think that obi is the more the most exciting of the three right and i think that there we see that excitement on the internet whether it's going to translate. I was just in London and I was talking to some Nigerians that, you know, who came in from Nigeria for the Cain Prize that I went to, uh, to hand out to, 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 to the winner. And uh, so there were a group of young people. In fact, two of them are lecturers who came from Nigeria and then uh, another person. So we were talking about the phenomenon around Obi and I was wondering whether there was something real about it or whether it was just an internet phenomenon. And they assured me that a lot of young people are indeed going to get their voters' cards and uh, with the intention of voting for Obi and of defending the vote. So maybe Obi will spring a surprise, perhaps. Uh, but in order to do that, 
he has to defeat the monster of his own flaws, uh, you know, and also the monster of ethnicity and religion and so on. Yeah, very, very, very good. I, I like how you um, went to that ethnicity and religion. Um, uh, the other candidate who is also um, uh, being considered as a major candidate is, is Tinubu, and, and he picked um, Shetima as his running mate, and, and that caused a lot of um, point is not important or is important. Do you think the Christian Association of Nigeria, uh, you know, that is something that they shouldn't worry about the way they are worrying about it? What is your position? Well, first of all, I, I think that Tinubu has had a very, a very terrible run so far in his campaign. Okay. If anything, I think that um, his campaign in the very early going is losing steam. Look at all the errors he's made, right? Uh, his physical and mental fitness, okay? There was that viral video where Tinubu appeared to have peed on himself, okay? That raises questions about his, his physical ability. There are these videos where Tinubu's hands are shaking, okay? Even when he was speaking at the APC convention, he could hardly articulate. There is an absence, there is a refusal of Tinubu perhaps to engage with journalists because Tinubu, when he speaks now, is a painful sight to watch. It's difficult for him to articulate a sentence. There is the fact that Tinubu just lost, okay, his own candidate, governorship candidate, who was the incumbent in Oshun State, lost to a man, Adeleke, who is most famous for partying and dancing. That's not a good sign, especially shortly after Tinubu just became the APC candidate and his party was the incumbent party in office and lost. So there was Tinubu in Ogun State before the APC convention, boastfully saying that it was his turn to become president. And in that speech, he managed to insult so many people. He insulted Igbo people, you know, uh, that Buhari had run with these three Igbo men and, you know, came to nothing. And then I basically made him president. Okay? And insulted the governor of Ogun State. Okay, um, so he had to apologize somewhat, but even the Yoruba people, I met uh, a savvy uh, Yoruba uh, friend in, in London, and he told me that Tinubu presumes to be Awo, but he says he's not in the conversation at all, and that Awo earned the love and the uh, uh, and, uh, adulation of the Yoruba people, but that Tinubu has earned money from the Yoruba people, but has done little uh, to earn the respect and reverence uh, that people used to have for our. And then he chooses, after the history that Nigeria has had for eight years and more, the history of Boko Haram, of unbridled attacks by herdsmen who have seized uh, communities, raped women, um, pillaged uh, farmlands without the government lifting a hand. A, a, a situation where over the last eight years there have been so many uh, attacks directed against, you know, both Muslims and Christians, but mostly against Christians by extremist Islamist groups. A case where Buhari has set a record for nepotism in the country, where every appointment seemed to be 
an opportunity for him to lift another uh, person from his own small part of the country uh, into office. So given all of that context, for Tinubu to choose a Muslim Muslim ticket and invoke states where that has happened or invoke the Abiola era, Nigeria is no longer in 1993. Okay, Nigeria has changed. And yet, the, perhaps the most important thing is that Tinubu himself seemed to have recognized that he did something that he ought not to have done. So he goes and hires a troop of clown, clownish actors and decks them out in the gamut of bishops and priests and pastors to grace or disgrace the occasion. So why would you do that if you were doing the right thing? A leader his soul would have said, I'm going to face people, the Nigerian people, and I'm going to explain to them why I have made this decision and why it makes sense. Okay, so Kashim Shetima has described himself and, as, and Tinubu as the dream team. And I said, if this is a dream team, then I want a nightmare team. Okay. And so it's an insult on the intelligence of Nigerians. It's an insult to Christians that you make a choice and then you orchestrate this clownish, tragic comic parade of fake pastors and bishops. Um, if you did the right thing, then just say, hey, I own it. And I'm going to make it make sense. So no, I don't think he did the right thing. And I think that his uh, presidential ambition is quickly going to fizzle. Okay. Now, um, we are going to also uh, bring in the audience to talk to you in a short while. But um, I still have a lot of questions, and uh, I wonder where we'll find the time to, to address that. I know. I know. We haven't no, even no, talked you, about, you, about the podcast. podcast. You are po podcast. You are yes. the same prize. Let's go to your podcast. And, and sure. um, I know that... Um, I looked at the titles of so one of some of the titles you gave to the to the podcast. So uh, on February 13th, you you had one. You said, uh, "Tinubu uh, uh, and others, please don't run." Please don't. So, run, yeah. yeah, at that point, you were telling them not to run. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then uh, I saw that on June 7th, you you said cancel 2023 elections, mm -hmm. and you proposed that a transitional government. Mm -hmm. Then on June 21st you made a further case against the 2023 elections. Um, then I see here uh, on uh, June 26, it was his P2B's election, question mark. So I see one is, there are a lot of question marks. So so it's like, and, and also I see the transition. You, you wanted to say this election should not happen, but you see that it's going on. And that's the question I want to ask people who are like you who are analyzing issues. Mm -hmm. You may not want something to happen, but the train is moving. Mm -hmm. What what do you do? You find yourself analyzing what is happening instead of Precisely. insisting that this is the wrong path that we are going. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to be ahead of the curve? A way to be you know to to not fall into this situation? Well. I, I tell you something, my, uh, the, fundamentally, my position is that we should suspend elections in Nigeria, that we don't have a country. That my idea is that you have an election uh, when you have a space that is coherent, a space that is recognizable, a, sp a space that is infused with values, a space that you can define. Nigeria is, is an amorphous, confused, chaotic, empty, space okay uh, i was showing you who said years ago at a lecture i gave at harvard that there is a space but there is no nation in this space so there's a space called nigeria but there's no national spirit and like Chebe said as i uh, indicated earlier in my first interview with him as a young journalist Chebe said that the nigerian nation has not been founded and nigeria is still looking for a founder, for, for somebody to be the, his founder. 
So, um, but Nigeria was able to keep maintaining the um, the, the facade, okay, of being a nation, okay. Because, yes, we had money, we could award contracts, we could, you know, get a national assembly, pay them a lot of money, and they would go there and uh, call each other, you know, my, my colleague, you know, my uh, distinguished colleague or whatever. But when you have a situation where um, several governors have now said that the central bank prints money, they have no more money, the, the Nigeria is earning nothing. So what you have is a worthless currency. When you have a country that has had decades of oil wealth, but we haven't even had something as basic as roads, Rudolph, you understand? As basic as roads. I mean, I've, I've traveled widely around the world. I've traveled within Africa itself. And you find poorer African countries, and at least they have roads, they have electricity, they have water. Okay? So you're looking at a country where all this time, since I was a child, you know, uh, power will, will have electricity for 15 hours or something, and we'll still be shouting, Nepal, when, they took, uh, when the light went up. We say well, they took light, <laughs> you know. Um, and suddenly we are looking at some areas that will go for weeks without power at all. A, a nation of the size of Nigeria generating 4,000 megawatts and less. A nation like Nigeria where universities, all universities will go on strike, will be shut down for six months. And nobody thinks it's wrong. And this is a regular, frequent event. A country where we have no healthcare system, where often when you take a patient to the hospital, a pastor, uh, the doctor will, will turn into a pastor and say, let us ask God to hear. Okay? So, Rudolph, we have spent, Achebe said it best when he said in his little political track, The Trouble with Nigeria, that Nigeria is a country that snatches defeat from the jaws of victory. We have everything that is required to create a first-class nation. So Nigeria has some of the best writers in the world, some of the best engineers in the world, best surgeons in the world, best professors in the world. They are teaching and doctoring and writing in different spaces around the world. But somehow our political leadership is farmed out to the worst, most reprobate, most reprehensible of our elements. And these are the ones who are willing to kill you if you stand in the way of them getting political power. And so these are the ones who are so um, mindless when they steal the resources of the state. They have no sense of moral restraint, okay? But we've left them for so long. So we don't have a country. Mm. So for me, I keep saying to Nigerians, I want to be that voice in the wilderness. Saying to Nigeria, listen, you don't have a country. Pause this election. Because every election in Nigeria comes with a lot of violence, a lot of people are killed. Uh, there's a lot of money that is wasted. The money that Tinubu and Atiku spent to buy their respective parties' nominations would have enabled all the lecturers to go back to school and our kids to be in, uh, to be in classrooms. Okay? So we don't have a nation. So instead of which politicians are going to distribute the little money that is left among themselves. Again, I had dinner with a, uh, a businessman in Nigeria just before I left Nigeria May 14. And he said to me that his business had, had been trying at that point to buy a few dollars, that every dollar had been picked up by politicians who were preparing for their uh, primary. primary. So a country where no politician feels a need to, to spell out a vision of the country, okay? Um, but instead just spends money and lines people up. And some of them will say, okay, 
before I give you money, you have to swear to some deity. I mean, it's, it's just, it's the sort of thing that should happen in the 12th century, not in the 21st century. That's okay. what's happening in Nigeria. Let so, me, let, let, so let me let me make this point. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I will keep crying to Nigerians, a voice in the wilderness saying, pause these elections, we don't have a country, you need a, an interim government of experts, an emergency government. But as I'm saying this, I also realistically know that uh, Nigerians, uh, many Nigerians are not willing to think at that level. So they are thinking of this current election. So, so I have to also pay some attention to what's going on now. And I know that there's this excitement around the OB. But as I've told people, yes, OB will be the best, uh, uh, OB is a better candidate uh, than Atiku and Tinubu. But OB is not magic man. Mm -hmm. So if OB wins, Nigerians will be so disappointed because there's no money and there is a limit to what, even with the best of intentions, he can do. Now, uh, why podcast? You know, I, I know you, you, you were writing columns for, for many years. Why yeah. did you change into podcast? And what is your podcast about? So my podcast is called Offside Musings, uh, which was also the title of my column uh, at um, the Daily Sun newspaper, which I, I wrote a column for 18 years, started in The Guardian newspaper, then I went to the Daily Sun, went briefly to 234 Next, then went back to the Daily Sun. I stopped writing my column in 2017, middle of 2017, not out of choice, but because the Daily Sun, which had an agreement with me over 10 years to pay me a certain amount, unilaterally decided to stop paying. So I said, uh, without telling me, and so once I found out, I said, no, you have to pay me the arrears of what you owe me. Because I'm a professional writer and um, I take my writing seriously. If you are not going to pay me what you've been paying me about 10 years, you have to at least have the courtesy to tell me and discuss it. Not to tell me, but we should discuss it. So, so I decided to uh, 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 Sort of take a long sabbatical, writing my you know books. I'm I'm I'm, I'm an author of books, and um, and uh, I teach at universities uh, occasionally. And um, but then last year, as we began to shape, uh, we began to uh, talk about the 2023 elections. Uh, uh, several newspapers in Nigeria be, uh, approached me uh, and proposed that I restart my column for them. But my experience in the past, whether when I was writing in, the, in uh, the Guardian or in the Sun, was that there was a lot of strife with the editors over my writing. They felt I was, you know, politicians would call them and say, uh, you have to stop okay and debate from writing, right? And so the editors will call me and say, ah, you are, you know, creating troubles for us. So, so I decided that this time around, rather than write in a paper, we should try to censor what I wrote, that I better write in a, in a platform uh, that I would control. And I also wanted to, this time around, speak particularly to young people. I want, because it's about them. More than 64% of the Nigerian population is made up of young people. And yet the country's politics is dominated by superannuated old men, geriatrics, who have absolutely no vision for running a, a nation. So I want young people to seize their country back from these buffoons. Okay, So I decided to choose a platform that is sort of more congenial to, to young people. And I recognize that a lot of them like to listen to things rather than read. But I also want to be able to reach my usual former audience of more adult uh, readers. So I do a podcast and then I do an accompanying column that follows the podcast. So it's actually two uh, services in one. How do you sustain it? It's difficult. And especially I've taken to traveling again. So last week I was in London as the chair of the 
a committee of judges for the 2022 Ken Prize. So I um, wanted to write something at least, but I was so busy. First of all, before I went to London, my wife and I uh, were in Portugal. We were celebrating 30 years of marriage. And uh, so right. thank you, thank you. So we spent a small vacation in Portugal and then we came to London uh, where I had to meet uh, with my fellow judges and do several events uh, before the award ceremony for the AKO came prize, which was uh, given last Monday night. Mm. Let, let's talk about that because uh, we, I think we have about 10 more minutes before sure. we let our audience in. Um, so came prize uh, for African writing is as far as I know for short stories. Yes. So, it's for short stories. It was established, I think, in 1999. Or the first prize was given in 1999 um, as an offshoot of the of the Booker Prize, actually. So uh, Michael Kane was the chairman of the Booker uh, group of companies, uh, which um, uh, established, endowed, mm -hmm. uh, established the, the Booker Prize. And so they, at some point, um, it was decided that as a way of honoring Michael Kane, that um, and uh, and he had, uh, you know, he had been a businessman. He'd done some business in Africa and so on. So um, a group of his friends and colleagues and so on decided to establish a Kane Prize for African short stories. So it's the entries are short stories. Uh, they they are by any African writer, whether on the continent or outside of the continent, one of your parents has to be an African, born in one of the 54 countries in Africa, and uh, in any language, uh, but it has to be translated into English. So you could, you could have written originally in Arabic or in Portuguese, provided there's an English translation, uh, you, you can enter your story. And... Um, and it pays ten thousand uh, pounds for the winning entry. The five writers, the four writers who are uh, who don't win but who on the shortlist get uh, five hundred pounds. Um, and so this year was um, a groundbreaking year in so many ways. Um, for two years they had not met physically to give the award because of COVID. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so. I was invited early this year to be to chair the uh, committee, the the panel of judges, um, um, and so not only was it the first year in three years that it was uh, the award ceremony was uh, in person physically, but uh, the number of entries this year broke all records. Before I think the record was about 160 stories. But this year we had 267 stories to read, out of which we spent uh, close to four hours de deciding the f five uh, writers, the five stories that uh, were on the short list. Uh, there were two Ghanaian writers, a Kenyan writer, a Nigerian writer, and a writer from Ethiopia. So ultimately, uh, the uh, Kenyan writer, Itza um, Luhumyo, uh, became the winner of this year's prize, and uh, she is a really stunningly uh, gifted writer. Mm. Now, people are wondering um, from the, the stories you read, do you think um, African stories uh, uh, in, in a good place uh, are there? Uh, Shoinkas, Nangugis, and Achebe's, uh, upcoming Gugis and Shoinkas, and Achebe's. Do you think um, African stories uh, uh, in, in a good place? Uh, are there uh, Shoinkas, Nangugis, and Achebe's, uh, upcoming Gugis and Shoinkas and Achebe's? I was, I was, in fact, deeply impressed um, by the entries in this year's prizes. Um, as a judge, um, one had to rank the stories from one to five. And um, of the 267, uh, there were at least close to 30 that I ranked at five. 
So there could have been 30 stories for me personally uh, that um, qualified that that could have been in contention with the prize. I was also struck by the uh, by the spread, the diversity of stories uh, that one encountered uh, there. Uh, African uh, writers used to be preoccupied with political, social, big issue, big theme. Uh, big themes uh, in their writing. Uh, what I'm seeing now is that African uh, younger writers in Africa are taking on every possible subject. You know, they are writing love stories, they are writing, celebrating identities, and um, you know, just uh, setting their stories abroad, setting them anywhere they please, and so on. So taking the kind of writerly license that um, was not the case uh, in past generations, at least not to the degree that I saw it. So I think that there is a wealth of talent on the continent and uh, that there is a vibrancy, there is an energy and passion uh, coming from African writers, definitely. Mm. So, so talking about the prize and and prizes in literature, it's a mm -hmm. controversial issue in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, it appears as if um, until someone gets a prize, until sure. some European or Western countries, uh, until a, a organization raises the hand of an African writer and say you won this prize, that um, they don't seem to get uh, the kind of respect you expect. Uh, is that accurate? Uh, description. Yeah, it's unfortunate. It's it's really unfortunate. And part of it is um give me a second. Um yeah, so part of it is is um is is that there's a there is African writing is still in a lot of ways in its youthful phase, right? And we have not done enough from within the continent to set aesthetic um, criteria for our writing so that unfortunately uh, my experience for example is that um, African publishers still look to writers who are picked up by uh, publishers in New York, in Paris, in London uh, so once you're picked up abroad, then African African publishers get interested in you. That uh, that they don't recognize that perhaps it is their place to show the world the best that Africa has to you know that Africa has to produce. Um, so there's an anomaly there, um, both in terms of the production of African writing, as well as um, uh, the the way in which uh prizes awards tend to shape the perception of critical success in an african writer so it's 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 unfortunate um but part of it i i ascribe to a relative uh youth of african writing so that people are still sort of grappling for how do we determine who is who, who is what being read, right? Mm -hmm. So ultimately, they go for they go for the person who's received uh, um, very um, plush awards and so on. But as we all know, there are writers who won awards, major awards, and they were destined for anonymity. Uh, and then there are writers who didn't win awards and uh, remain uh, enduring um, artists uh, and live in the memories of people. So it, it's important to to put all uh, you know literary prizes in perspective. Mm. Now I'm talking about that because we have one in Nigeria, the NLNG Prize. Yes, uh, it gives out um, hundred thousand dollars. Which is a lot more than the ten thousand pounds the yes. Kemp Prize uh, gives out. Yes. But the Kemp Prize um, has more, um, I think, uh, more. <laughs> Absolutely, um, prestige, if you like. Prestige, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Why is it that well, 
the Nigerian uh, prize of hundred thousand dollars. It's not um, so. There are some books that won the Nigerian prize that you can find on Amazon. It's a shame, isn't it? It's a real shame. Um, it's it, it's um, first of all, I'll, I'll put it this way. I my my um, my take on the NL NLNJ prize is that it's it's a very in my view, misconceived prize. There is no point in paying a hundred thousand dollars to a writer in Nigeria. You know, and what they do is I think they have three year cycles cycles. So one year they give to fiction, another year they give to poetry, then they give to children. drama. Or children or, or, or children. I think. Books. Uh, I think. Okay, so the way I look at it is, if you have $100,000 to play with, why don't you give $15,000 prize every year to fiction, every year to poetry, every year to drama, okay? And then, or even make it 10,000, 10, and then use the 70,000 to support the publication of this book you know there are publishers in england in this country that you can engage in partnership with so that the winner of the prize or the winners of the prizes in nigeria are then find publishers in these spaces as well i mean of course some of the books that win are already published abroad right but if it is a book published in nigeria that wins then you should be able to strike an agreement where you defray the cost of some publishers or you offer uh, an amount for them to do promotions of this winner so that it becomes he or she becomes part of their list and then goes to certain conferences and uh, literary festivals around the world. So as you said rightly, it's, it's, it's a shame that we have a prize in Nigeria that, that pays $100,000 to the winner. And apart from Nigerian newspapers and one or two African websites, that's hardly reported. Okay. But the Kim Prize winner was in every major uh, newspaper in the UK. Oprah Magazine uh, online has published it, and so on and so forth. So. So there is something also about um, just the way that you, you conceive the story, the way you tell your story. So it's, again, one of those issues of Nigeria not being able to package itself well, not being able to tell a story well. Mm. Because if you have $100,000 to pay for a book, that's one of the richest prizes that books get anywhere in the world. But we have failed to tell that story. We have t failed to tell the story of the winner to make that winner seem to matter uh, as a writer in the mm -hmm. world. Okay, uh, one, one last question before we okay. go. I know that um, uh, before we let the audience come in, um, yes. one yes. last question. Yes. So, um, uh, last question. That is, um, what what uh, Chimamanda came out uh, the other day to endorse Peter B, essentially saying, I cannot wait to to vote for for him and i know that um part of this subject of this conversation is the role of a writer in in in, uh, in a democracy and in, mm -hmm. in affairs of, of the continent uh, yeah. of Africa. so what what do you think about that writer's role in in, in this uh, con conversation about politics in nigeria and mm -hmm. well no i think that every, it's, it's a question that every writer has to answer for him or herself. You know, um, I'm never prescriptive about these things. I personally uh, refrain from. Um, uh, endorsing any candidate. Um, I am by uh, vocation, by choice, a social critic, a political analyst. And so 
I cannot be seen. I mean, I've written that Obi appears to be the most exciting candidate and to excite the greatest attention, especially amongst young people. That's as far as I go. Um, I'll never be caught um, endorsing Peter Obi. And I also don't share with people, by the way, who I vote for um, um, as a citizen. If I were in Nigeria, I would vote. I always I take voting seriously. I vote in America religiously, but I make a point of not discussing uh, this choice that I make, um, except with very close loved ones. Okay, all right. We will take a break. When we come back, we will get the audience involved in this conversation. So stay tuned. Hello? Oh, hello? <laughs> uh, uh, hello? Can, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? You can. I can't hear you, though. I, I, I cannot hear you. Oh, boy. You can hear me. Yes, I, I just heard you a bit. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> all right. So that was that. <laughs> all right. So so we have a lot of people who are trying to join us and they want to have a conversation with you. We are going to bring them in. Uh first of all, let me um let me bring in your co or the studio is full already. Uh it's just oh, I just started. Okay. Uh, the studio is full. We haven't even started uh, taking questions. Okay, so we'll probably do more than 30 minutes of questions. Um, I wanted to bring you a co-host, but I can't find him now. I think he's uh, on the road somewhere. He's driving home, and okay. he will join us as soon as he gets home. Okay, all right, all right. So, so um, we, we've had a lot of uh, subjects and conversations, and I don't think I should waste more time um, talking to you. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's just bring in uh, other people who, who might have better questions than the ones I had. Um, so uh, joining us from Lagos is uh, Sunday Wonsu. Sunday Wonsu, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Rudolph. Doctor, I uh, respect you. All right, thank you. My, uh, my, my, my special brother, Ndebe, you're welcome, sir. Okay, good. Uh, CM, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rudolph. Okay. Nneka, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Alaro, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, Alex, welcome to the show. Uh, Neckman, welcome to the show. <laughs> Ovie, welcome Thank to you, the show. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. And Femi, welcome. Oh. So what we're going to do is, um, I'll okay. give everybody a chance to, to, to ask a okay, question uh, or make a comment. And then, <laughs> can you please mute your, mute your system if you have, unless I call your name to speak? Um, so I'll give, a, I'll, give you a I'll give you a chance to ask a question. Just make it brief, one minute. Don't go beyond that. After that. Um, after that, uh, we will uh, let you go so that other people will have an opportunity. It's already full, and we can add any new person um, who may want to talk. So let me start with you. Uh, Sunday wants to welcome, and any question for okay? Unmute yourself, Sunday. Okay. First yeah. of all, uh, I will say thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jackery and the damages. In all your good work you're doing right this time around, anyway. And um, I, when I heard about your guest, uh, uh, 
speaker today the debate i took me almost an hour 30 minutes waiting patiently to listen and hear him out and um generally my brother we are sitting on a kind of a dynamite nigeria i know people can say it's not a nation because the parameter of what a nation is all about cannot be simplified in the context of this nation and uh, most importantly let me use this word of um p2b coming to the race uh, you know um, as a third force uh, yes i know uh, the man uh, the trick for the three major, four major candidate yeah the system seems to be it seems to be the best candidate among others uh, um, but the main issue now is this it's not a question of individual to be as an individual he, as a as a, as a, in a governance, one man cannot do a magic but the problem of this nation is the, 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 the there is no institutionalized institution that can be able to do things rightly for example now no matter how good good intent or intentions Mr. President, it will be if eventually Nigeria believes in him and voted him in. That power that be, could they have to happen? That is one simple question yet to be answered. Secondly, the indices of him dispatching dispassionately those good things he think that will translate this nation from the worst scenario to a better situation, can that institution be allowed to do that job? Like the members of the National Assembly, who are the people there, the so called governors we have in the system, who are there? You know, it's not easy to take away a kind of an old narrative. Most of these people who have benefited much, endlessly, pushing us back to the background, they know what the problem is. For example, if I may ask, the problem of the region is not because people there are not sound. But because of the few elites benefit much, so much, in the so-called in publishing mental manipulation of these young ones, and in a situation that they had the Western education, the question I'm asking. But if the children are out there in all parts of the world acquiring the same Western education, so we need to go back and show that we strongly believe in the position of in debate. The election itself is not even based. The best is to assemble a group of people that will be able to discuss how this nation can move forward. But based on this particular system we have, even if Jesus Christ comes into the system, I am telling you, the same evil struggles we still and do any way to pull them down, to pull him down. Thank right. you for now. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. We appreciate that. Okay. What we're going to do is we get maybe three questions and comments and then you can respond and they'll get another three so cm go ahead thank you rudolph and then uh, good afternoon from uk professor ndibe i've listened uh, attentively in fact i've been here since morning waiting for this appointed time so that i do not miss out i read you every week you said nigeria has the best engineers in the world, the best doctors in the world, the best scientists in the world, or one of the best professors in the world, and one of the best writers in the world, of which you are one. So my, the challenge I want to throw to you, I hope you do not uh, turn it down, is have you considered, probably with Rudolf, you, Rudolf, Chimamanda, Chiku Nibwe, um, Chido Onoma, and you know your you know your cast, all of you. Say a yearly because Nigeria is begging for survival in every sphere of human activity. Yearly you organize a writer's workshop or anything just to encourage so that we can have the next the next uh, after uh, so that we could have uh, the next um Achebe's uh, showing cast and all the coming through. If you have to, if you have taken the challenge, I will thank you. But if you haven't, I will say why not. Thank you. All right. Uh, one more, then he will answer, and then we'll let the people whose questions have been answered or comments uh, responded to go, so that we let new people coming. Alaro, go ahead. Um, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be around you, and um, I commend you for all your achievements. 
So you said basic leadership and foresight to bring knowledge together from across the board, from across the country, but only through an interim government, which is what you started out with. But what I, I would like for you to realize is that all the nations we now praise, all those nations we now glorify, like the UK, which you glorify through the, the um, award you just did, all have their own difficulties to come above, which they accomplished by not giving up. That's um, a, uh, a comment in a way. We have to correct the consumptive principle and implement a productive society. And with this productive society, will Nigeria have a chance? Now, I therefore agree with you, with your solutions, but I believe that more in your solutions, they are only visible through a leadership by Peter B, which in a way you commend and in other ways you condemn. With all these great forces that we have across the board and all these great leaderships that we do have across the board, which you only, which you also a part of, and now beg of you to be more constructive and more positive minded in a way that just a minute. That's okay. what I did. Okay, now I would like for you to be more constructive and be more positive minded because your words mean a lot. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, and all right. preach uh, more that you can now we can bring Nigeria forward. Okay. The negative aspect we're going to hear it every day, so I commend you and I thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, all you right. can take, take the question. Sure. All way. right, uh, uh, by the way, thank you very much for uh, uh can you hear me well? Everybody? Yeah, we can hear you. okay, so thank you very much for um this engagement. Um so to respond to Sonny first in the order in which uh, people made comments or ask questions. Sonny, I absolutely agree with you. That's actually my point. Um, a lot of people have begun to cast P2B as magic man, all right? Uh, elect P2B and all our problems will disappear. And uh, part of why I said that an OB presidency would be disastrous is that Nigeria is fundamentally askew, okay? The, the country has gone, uh, has not been founded, if you, if you understand what I mean. So, um, uh, so as Sonny rightly said, if you put in uh, an angel to run Nigeria, the angel is going to be undermined, subverted, at every turn. We have a country where um, most of our resources are stolen <clears throat> by men and women who never pay a price, who never go to jail. <clears throat> we have a country where terrorists can go into a church, you know, walk and kill dozens of people, and the government just issues a statement and says it's ISWA, the Islamic uh, State of West Africa province. We have a state where uh, a young woman is uh, barbecued in public and there is no trial almost several weeks later. Nobody is held to account. We have a state where there are no roads to speak of, where there is no running water, where trash is not picked up. So we have a country that is an open toilet. So when Nigerians travel, they stop anywhere. I'm sorry, Alero, but we cannot be blind to the reality that we don't have a country. And so with all his best intentions, an OB presidency ultimately will be marginally better than what we've seen before, but is still fundamentally incapable of addressing the issues uh, and the crisis in Nigeria. So Sonny's point is well taken that we need institutional um, uh, bedrock uh, for the country. 
a country like the United States, or if you take any country in the world that is a productive, self-sustaining society, already has within itself shock absorbers, cushions, so that even if you have a terrible president for eight years, in the end, the institutions in that country are able to absorb the damage that this president might make. In Nigeria, you have you had an Obasanjo who authorized somebody like Adedibo to go and sack a governor, Ladoja, from his office. The governor had to jump through the window to run. You had an Obasanjo who uh, empowered Chris Oba to go and use the Nigerian police to abduct a governor. Okay? And nobody has been held to account. So we don't have a country. And that's where I start fundamentally. But we need our institutions. We no longer need big men. We don't need strong men. We need institutions. That's the mistake that Nigerians often make. They think uh, if we could have a Rollins kind of person and he will shoot a bunch of people, then everybody will sit up. Nigeria is past that level of dysfunction. Um, and it's as if you look at it, um, I watched a video of some university students who went to see the Nigerian Minister for Education. And they reminded the minister that his own children were going to school abroad and classes, they were going to classes. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, university lecturers have been on strike since February 14. And the, lecturer, uh, the minister got up and walked out on them. So Nigeria, as Achebe said in the trouble with Nigeria, is actually run by people who are strangers. So they reap from the country and they take what they've stolen abroad and they have a good life there. If you remember, or maybe I'll, I'll respond to this when I come to Alero. So I agree that what we, what we need is to build institutions and the best way to build those institutions. At this point, no president can do that, okay? The best way to do that is to start from the very foundational moment and say, okay, we're going to decide what Nigeria means. First of all, the first question is actually whether Nigerians have the stamina and the inclination to stay together. If they don't, you cannot force people to live together if they don't want the marriage, okay? If we establish that we have the stamina and the intent to be together in Nigeria, then we have to decide the terms of engagement, the terms of those relationships. And that's why I say that what we need at this point is a conference, a national government, not a conference, but a government of experts, if you like, who will begin then to determine the shape of the country in different sectors in education, in terms of job creation, in terms of the judiciary, in terms of law enforcement, and so on and so forth. So let me go to CM, who says that Nigeria has some of the best, you know, echoed my uh, argument that Nigeria has some of the best and has thrown a challenge, Rudolph, to you, uh, to Chido, uh, to Chimamanda, and to a bunch of us. Do we go to give workshops in Nigeria? Uh, CM, my, my, the answer is yes and no, okay? Um, I have done, I do a lot of public speaking in Nigeria, um, and I, I was a Fulbright scholar in Nigeria. I taught for a year at the University of Lagos. It was a traumatic experience to get into the classroom. Uh, Unilag did some of the uh, deans at Unilag did their best to make sure that <laughs> that I, I wasn't there teaching, but I stuck it out. It's, it's something that I will account in a book at some point. So I do go to literary festivals in Nigeria and elsewhere in Africa. I'm invested. I uh, mentor some writers, young writers in Nigeria and elsewhere in Africa. But it is not easy. Um, writers are not extremely well-paid people, okay? In order to do a writing workshop, you have to hire a venue, right? Or you have to have somebody who will lend you a big house, okay? Uh, you have to bring people there. You have to have books for them to read. Um, you have to provide them computers to write on and so on and so forth. So there's a lot that goes into it. So it's not easy. Uh, I know that Chimamanda for years now has run uh, um, a creative writing workshop. 
Um, I have participated in some uh, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Nigeria, but I don't run one regularly. And trust me, I've talked to Nigerian governments, several, several governments, to start such a uh, workshop. I have offered my services for free, but our leaders are not interested in investing in the development of young people. That's the truth. And their own young ones uh, are abroad. You know, I can tell you a story of going to Lincoln University, which Zeke and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Nkrumah attended years ago to give uh, a talk. And I have appeared there to find out that there was a scholarship scheme or some kind of exchange between uh, Bielsa State and the university in Pennsylvania. Every kid who was sent there was the son or daughter of a top government official in Bielsa. And when I spoke to the kids, I told them that their parents had wrecked Nigeria. And I said, I'm not holding it against you. I said, but you have a moral duty when you get your education to go and begin to undo the damage that your parents had, had made in Nigeria. So I do my best, in other words, uh, CM, um, whenever I get invited, but I have to pay my flight ticket. I put myself in a hotel. I have to rent a hotel room to do a workshop. So the, the much that I do is that when I'm invited, I go, right? Um, I get paid to speak in America, to speak elsewhere in the world. When I typically go to Nigeria, I offer myself for free. Uh, but I would insist that people buy my flight ticket because I can't deprive my family in order to go uh, give a workshop. Um, so, Alaro, part of what you said is, the need is, is that other countries that we glorify went through difficulties to attain and, and accomplish what they have. That's sort of the rhetoric that I hear from some Nigerians who want to defend the indefensible. Our country is not defensible, okay? Uh, I have had people say to me, uh, Rome was not built in a day. To excuse the dysfunction of Nigeria, the absolute tragedy in Nigeria. And what I respond to them is, we can excuse the people who built Rome if they took decades to build Rome. Now we have a template. We should not build our own Rome as many decades as it took the original founders of Rome to build Rome because they've already provided us with a template. In a sense, we can build our own Rome in a day, in a metaphoric day, right? You take the story of the Emir or the Sheikh of Dubai. There's a story, an interview he had on 60 Minutes, a U.S. program, and I encourage Nigerians to go watch it. So you see what vision does. And this man says, just about 30 something years ago, he said, I sat down and I felt that my country should have the best. And Leslie Stahl, the CBS uh, reporter says, what do you mean the best? And the man said, I wanted us to have the best in education, the best in finance, the best in technology. And guess what? Today, our people troop to Dubai because Dubai has the best. And what I tell them is that it is men and women like themselves who have created the societies that we want to bask in, okay? And so what we have is almost pretend leaders. In fact, it's not almost. We have pretend leaders. And so typically you ask a Nigerian leader, what are you going to do if you get, get office? And he says something like, I'm going to move the nation or the state forward. It is a lazy, is the laziest possible thing because actually sometimes you, you don't move forward, you want to move back. Because if there's a ditch in front, you want to move back, okay? So the whole idea of, I'm gonna uh, provide the dividends of democracy, I want to move the nation forward um, and so on. It's just a sense of laziness. And that is part of why P2B continues to resonate today because P2B seems to Nigerians to articulate the problems of the country and to profile uh, solutions uh, that, you know, in a way that Nigerians find exciting. Um, so, no, I want there to be a productive country, not one that consumes. Ken Sarawuwa famously said 
that the, the world has become a global village, but that Nigerians in their obsession with consumption have become global idiots, you know? And in a lot of ways, that is what we prove again and again and again. We have leaders who live for their stomachs only, okay? A leader who will tell you that he's wearing a $50,000 wristwatch. And meanwhile, his country is a slum. Even the state house is a slum, you know? And so let's not make a prescription to be positive about a country that has nothing positive going in it. The only thing positive in Nigeria is actually the, what I call the, um, the staying power of Nigerians. The fact that in the face of all kinds of difficulties, Nigerians are able to wake up every day and to recreate their lives, okay? It's a miracle. And the fact that there is creativity happening in that country, that you have great music coming out of Nigeria, you have great writers coming out of Nigeria, you have, you know, just people holding up. So every year, if I were a Nigerian leader, I will give national honors, not to governors and heads of states and uh, chiefs of staff and so on. I'll give it to those who push trucks, to the traders at Alaba market and other markets, to the market women who grow and sell tomatoes and so on. Those are the ones who sustain this country that is every day killed by its political leadership. And we must call them out. We must call them out. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so what we're going to do now is I will beg, um, if your question is answered already, you give us room, you can watch on, um, you can watch on live stream, any of the stream, uh, social media uh, places, Facebook, uh, YouTube, so that we can let more people come in and have uh, opportunity to ask questions, okay? So please, um, I will now call on um, Declan to ask your question. Hi, uh, hi, Raf and Okay. Nice to see you both. Yes. Um, I guess I have more of a more of a comment to to reinforce what 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 you've been talking about in terms of some of the spectacular talent that is in Nigeria, and and, and just how Nigeria doesn't really benefit it from that compared to all these Nigerian medical professionals in the United States, for example, who are educating the next generation of American doctors. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, Nigeria is such an interesting place um, because it's so large in terms of population and, and, and the demographics are so robust. And every other country in the world, um, China is a really good example, is able to tap into that, right? And so part, so, so part of the reason China is able to make such strides is they've got so many people. And so they're gonna have, uh, you know, with all the billions of people they have, they're going to have math geniuses. They're, and all they need to do is identify this talent and then just pipeline it. And then that will help, uh, that will help, you know, the future China, similar the way um, the United States is so large. And we tapped into um, all these technical experts um, who, who we put into government and, and they were able to kind of craft U.S. institutions, um, despite the average American not really understanding or appreciating that. So, Nigeria is an example of a place where all of these people exist, uh, and as soon as they can, they flee uh, and 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 live live an amazing life, you know, outside the country. So that's um, that's kind of the observation that reinforces, I, I think, your point. Um, so. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, let me go to Chido. Chido uh, is my co-host. <laughs> He's been traveling. I saw him now. I forgot about him. <laughs> so, Chido, um, I don't know where you are, what airport where you are, but um, come on, uh, have your say. Thank you, Rudolph. I'm in the main airport in SH country. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Hi, yeah. Uh, okay, it's good to see you, Declan. I was supposed to be part of the show, but. As Rudolph said, I've been traveling. I just have, came in from Kempi, Nassau State to Abuja Airport, and uh, now the flight has been delayed for another hour. We hope we don't get to Lagos by midnight. But that, that's the story of our life. I, I just wanted to find out, and I've been in and out of the program, and I, my question may have been addressed, whether directly or through comments. But and I've been following Oke's uh, fantastic intervention in Nigeria. Uh, I've had conversations with other people about it in terms of 
people were looking at the role of writers. Okay. Um, Chido, um, I can hear you. I wanted the announcement. So <laughs> I just try to talk to you. Yeah, please talk question, to me. Yeah, the question is, uh, there is an existential crisis. And you and I on uh, on the same, there is an agreement on this in terms of what needs to be done. I do not believe that any of the presidential con uh, candidates currently in this process can bring about the kind of the, the, the vision we have for a new Nigeria, not because some of them do not have the capacity or the ability to bring about change, but because of the structure and nature of our society. For you would have heard this said over and over again, the country at independence was rigged to fail, it was set up to fail, and we've not made any move since 1959 when we got uh, the Prime Minister, then 60 at independence up until now to challenge that. Uh, for me, one of the most fundamental questions about Nigeria was the one raised by uh, the late Chibola, which I used in one of my books, uh, Nigeria is Negotiable, which is to say, uh, there are two basic questions we need to ask ourselves as Nigerians. One is, uh, do we want to remain together as one people? If the answer to that question is yes, under what condition? Yes. I think the fundamental question we face today is the existential. We, we don't have any. We are just people, and people just go from one place to the other. If you... So... My challenge now is what role, and Declan uh, raised an important question. When we look at the data statistics, we talk about uh, Nigerians are perhaps the best diaspora community in America and other. It's because it's the best of Nigeria that leaves the country. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you expect? In other countries, I think it's not their best. They don't, the best of the people there don't leave. My generation, your generation of Nigerians, uh, all those of them who went into academia, they are all in U.S., British, American uh, Saudi University, Arabia, Can whatever. yeah, Canadian, Canadian universities are people who ought to be in the country. Mm -hmm. So even those who govern us do not believe in country. Then the question is, or the challenge before us is, how do we ensure, as writers? And the foundation of every nation, whether you look at the U.S. where you are, the likes of Thomas Paine and so on, have our writers been able to, and I think you were the guy there many years ago when the conversation about Nigeria, uh, there was this debate in the Guardian between the likes of uh, Edwin Madinaju and uh, uh, Gigi Dara and uh, the late uh, Professor Bala Usman. Mm -hmm. Have we done enough to even say, this is the nature of the, the, the society we want to create, the vision of that society as writers, as contributors, so that whether it's young people, whether it's those civil society or anywhere, so that people can run with that. I think that's the challenge before us as writers, as activists. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chido. Um, let's go. Oh, go um, Rudolph, Rudolph, yeah, yeah. I must intervene and say that uh, Ifoma, the, the lone woman I see in the, in the room, should speak. Yeah, I was about to go to her because uh, it appears as if she should leave now, about to leave. Uh, Ifoma, over to you. Uh, unmute yourself, please. Good. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, sorry. So you might echo a little bit because I'm in a room by myself. Um, okay, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, um, I don't know where you are. Yeah, good afternoon. But, uh, I've been listening in and out. I'm sure you see me walking around on my walk. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't listen to the whole program, but I've been picking up uh, some pieces and you know, pick it, uh, putting up together. And I have some questions, and um, you might have been answered, I don't know. But uh, this is some of the things I said yesterday in the program. And, uh, and I still want to repeat that because I see that 
uh, none of these presidential candidates are just answering this question of insecurity in Nigeria. And this is one of the main issues <laughs> that uh, our problem in Nigeria at this point. Um, a country where you don't have security, you're trying to attract investors. The same thing I said yesterday. How are we going to solve that? I have not heard to them and Atiku, they haven't even told us what they're going to do for us as a Nigeria. We'll only be that it's actually saying something. Also, um, the issue of electricity. Um, I heard, I think you said something about industrialization. And I'm asking the list of the problem or the list of the things that can help to contribute to that in, uh, industrialization is electricity. Um, Obasanjo, we have Obasanjo, Buhari, Yaradua, all these presidents, and up to now we don't have that electricity in Nigeria. I have a cousin who is in manufacturing industry. The last time I spoke to him, he told me that he is gradually folding up because he cannot sustain the price of uh, uh, fuel to sustain um, his industry. Where, what are we doing about that? And what do you think we can do about that? And final, one more thing. I have a lot of questions for you. Wow. Um, a lot of questions. But one more thing. Nigeria is borrowing money to service our loans. What have we done with the money we have borrowed? All the money we have borrowed from other countries. What have we done with the money in Nigeria? I haven't seen nothing. Because it's like we are getting work every day. And there is no accountability. Um, does it mean that we're going to forget about uh, all the money that has been stolen, uh, stolen or looted from our country and then move on as if nothing happens and wait for the next president to come? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, if you want me to take one more person, then, then you sure. can answer. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Femi, go, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Rudolph and uh, Professor Ndebe. Um, I'm an avid follower of your colleagues, including, um, I don't know if you still do some in uh, Son or Deribal. I, anyway. I, I actually do a podcast now called the Offside Musings right. Podcast. So my columns, uh, I do a podcast and then mm -hmm. there's an accompanying column on the same subject. All right. Yeah. So uh, permit me to use this opportunity to remem remember uh, uh, Professor Pius Adesomi. Uh, the late professor, one of the most erudite, most um, amazing um, brains that Nigeria has ever produced, and definitely one of your uh, contemporaries as well. Um, it was he that mentioned the fact that Africa is the forward the world needs to, to face. But, uh, and pivoting to that as well, um, I tried to dig up, dig up this, um, uh, war, uh, this comment from Mandela. Uh, when, where he, wherein he said that the world would, would not respect Africa of, until Nigeria um, ends that respect. Now, the reasons why these uh, two uh, different uh, comments are germane to uh, discussion for today to me is concerning the fact that, for example, um, when you look at the issue of Botswana as a country mm -hmm. itself, the so-called the little miracle of Africa, it's called. Mm -hmm. The contribution of Nigerian professionals to what that country has become today tells us a lot about the fact that it's not just our, our leaders, but even we as a people. Because I, for me, um, I know we could, we seem to know all the problems about Nigeria. Everybody seems to have a problem, uh, know the problem and the solution to Nigeria. But one thing I continue to ask myself, especially considering the fact that myself and yourself have a certain is setting history in terms of the fact that you were born in Ogongola, Yola, I think. Mm -hmm. I was born in Kaduna. Mm. And I recall that, um, and I've mentioned this, uh, this I've, I shared it before with, with them on the forum, that I, I remember going to take uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, there's this thing you do after you pass the NDA exams. Professor, I was one of the top students, candidates, for entry into NDA, what I saw there mimics what you said you saw in terms of uh, when you were, were at Columbia. It, the kinds of things I saw in 1990, this was 1997, I was a 17-year-old young boy. I'm dating myself now. It's traumatic when you understand the fact that this thing goes from, sometimes it's from uh, bottom up, but I believe it's from, um, yeah, I think it's from bottom up because the leaders do not fall from the sky. 
And that's why I also understand the fact that it's more of a structural problem. And for me, if we do not first become a nation before we're a country, because a country is just a mere geographical expression like someone described. If we do not first become a nation, there's no way we can become Nigeria. And which is where I align with you. But basically, where my question is private into is what what do you think in what do you think we can do beyond just trying to bring together eggheads, if you will? Because my thinking is we, we better restructure first. It's I mean, call it whatever one wants to call it, whether we need to discuss the terms of our in terms, terms of engagement, send the terms of engagement. Do we want to become a country? Because even if we divide South Sudan, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, um, uh, seceding from Sudan and Eritrea, seceding from Ethiopia, are case studies for what is likely to happen, even because we know ourselves our division goes even down to the most my, micro, minuscule um, village or hamlet in uh, Ogun State or somewhere in Imo. Mm -hmm. So, my thinking is what do you think about um, be, beyond all of uh, this restructuring? What do you how do you think we can change our mindset as a people? Good. Okay, Femi, thank you. Uh, okay, Good. hold on. Okay, mm -hmm. I I think um I don't want uh, Ovia to leave his outside. I think he might want to uh, go out in there to hear him. Uh, I need him to speak. So just one more, one more, then you can. Okay, okay. sure. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you for reading my facial expression. So <laughs> is the is the village what now? Uh, village athletics. Oh, village athletics. Village okay. athletics. Okay. Yes. Yes, uh, my question is, will you agree with me that um, in every given society, the easiest, thing to the easiest thing to do is to criticize, and the second easiest thing to do is to protest, to which anybody can do that, regardless of your level of education or your level of awareness. But will you not agree with me that inability for me and you to organize and put those criticism into action is where we have failed or failing. Wonderful. So that's what that's all about. Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, Declan, it's such a delight uh, to see you. I, I bet from uh, Nairobi, right? Oh, good. Um, so absolutely, I, I agree with you uh, that part of the crisis in Nigeria is Nigeria's, um, it, it's a point that Chido made, that we have both capital flight out of Nigeria and capital flight you can actually contain or deal with, withstand the consequences of it. But when you have brain drain, which is a peculiar and particular um, uh, pathology of Nigeria, that we're a country happy to send our best and brightest to other countries. Um, and uh, during the military regime uh, of, of, of uh, Babangida, uh, he used to uh, regard professors, academics, and so on as disgruntled elements. So the faster they left the country, the happier he became. Uh, because the, the space was then emptied of these disgruntled elements who disturbed his peace, uh, his peace to be able to uh, basically steal the nation to extinction. And so you have a country uh, that, that uh, sends its best and brightest uh, into exile. I remember uh, years ago, um, Wale Shonika was in exile for the second time in his life, and he gave a talk uh, uh, at the university in Massachusetts, so I happened to be there, and I stood at the back of this packed hall with Ifi Amadume. And as Shoinka spoke, Ifi Amadume sort of, you know, um, uh, nudged me, and she said to me that the tragedy of Nigeria was for her at that moment reducible to the fact that Wale Shoinka is in exile and that Bacha was presiding over Nigeria. So it could, you know, it told the story in that kind of microscopic uh, way. And not only do we send our best outside, we send our best money, our earnings outside of the country. And it's not a story that started today. 
Hello? Hello? Okay. Yeah, go so ahead. We, go ahead. So we send, yeah, go we ahead. send we our guests outside of the country. And um, I remember um, years ago in 2001, 2002, I became a naturalized American citizen. The U.S. government, through its Fulbright program, sent me to teach at Lagos State University. Uh, but once I got that award, they said that in Nigeria, uh, classes were often very iffy. So if they send you to Nigeria, they have you uh, adopt a research project in case you arrived in Nigeria and universities were on strike so that you have something that you are doing. We arrived in Nigeria and staff of the embassy came to pick us up and told us that Lasso staff and faculty started a strike just two days before we arrived. That strike lasted three months. So we offered, my wife and I offered ourselves to Unilife to teach. We could have sat at home, quote unquote, doing our research. But I wanted to give something of myself. I wanted to encounter students of English and to sort of teach them my, you know, the skills that I have. The insult that we faced at Unilife. So there was a dean at Unilag who, first of all, said, uh, first of all, the English department was desperate to have me. The art department wanted my wife. But this dean said, uh, why should they take somebody, people who were rejected by last week? And this was all in a memo. Then his, the chairs of the department wrote to him and said, no, they were not rejected by Lasso. Lasso was on strike, so they offered themselves to us. And this man then said, well, if we're going to have them, that he wanted the U.S. government to officially repost us to Unilag. So we went to the embassy. The embassy wrote us letters copied to him, saying that we were now sent officially to Unilag. This man read the letter and said, no, they should not write to us and copy him, that they should write to him and copy us. So we went back to the U.S. embassy and we said, hey, write to the big man and just copy us. So they did that. And the man's next reaction was that before we could start to teach, that he wanted us, it is director of academic planning to interview us and see if we were qualified to teach at Unilag. So at, some, at that point, I used an expletive to uh, the head of the Department of English who was telling me this and who, of course, described him as a fool. So I said to my wife, that's it, we're going to do our research. But one day, they, uh, the English department called me and said, ah, we're waiting for you. We're giving you two classes. So I said, hey, I thought you were waiting for me to go and take an exam to prove that I could teach at Unilag. And they said, forget that fool. Uh, they had given us classes to teach. At that point, as I was relating this story to somebody, he told me of a Nigerian who was a vice president at a pharmaceutical company in America a PhD in pharmacy. The man was making millions in compensation every year. And he decided that he wanted to return to Nigeria to teach. He wanted to take a semester every year to go and give of himself in Nigeria. So he wrote a letter to the university where he did his first degree in Nigeria and said, here is who I am. I'm a senior vice president at this major uh, pharmaceutical company in America. I'm offering to come every semester, every year to come one semester and teach for you for free. And he did not hear back from the uh, head of the department. The next time he went to Nigeria, he went to this man's office to see him. He signed the paper. This man kept him waiting for hours. And finally, when he was ushered into the man's office, the man said, hey, how can I help you? So he said to the man, I wrote you a letter offering to come and teach here. And the man said to him, hey, you can't just walk in here and uh, ask to teach. You know, there's procedures. You know, so he said at that point, he said to the man, okay, please hold your classes. I'm going back to America. So this is a highly qualified Nigerian. So I tell people, Obama was president in America for two terms, one of the popular American presidents. If Obama were in Nigeria, the best Obama would have is to be somebody's chief of staff or speechwriter. And even at that, if Obama spoke in a certain way, okay, to say the head of state, to the president, 
people will say, ah, oh God, this man is taking too much. Or look at, does he think that because he blows grammar? Do you understand? So we are suspicious of talent. We reject talent. We accept mediocrity in our country. And it's at every point. So you go to your local government area. Go for that matter to your hometown. And you offer to lead the town to bring the benefit of your learning, your enlightenment to the town. People will say, uh -huh, how old are you? Uh, look at this one. You think he speaks English and so on and so forth. So there's this suspicion that we have, this allergy, if you like, we have to, to ideas. Okay? So Declan, you actually make a very astute point that we are not tapping into, first of all, we drive our best talent abroad and then we reject their offer even to come to Nigeria and give the benefit of their experience of their training for free sometimes. Um, so Chido, I agree with you about the existential crisis. <laughs> Bola Ige got it right. Um, that's the central question, which as I said, we have not answered. And all our thinkers, all our major writers have gone back to that point. Uh, as I said in my uh, sensitive interview with Rudolf, Wole Shoinka, at a talk at Harvard, said that there is a space called Nigeria, but there, a nation did not inher in that space. There is no nation in that space. And Achebe, uh, years ago, told me in my first interview with him that the Nigerian nation had not been founded. And if we go back to Achebe's novel, in Things Fall Apart, for example, there's a very um, eye-opening moment in the early parts of the novel after Biokonkwa has been found guilty, right, of bribery and corruption. And the Umwafe community meets in Lagos to decide how to respond to that. The elder says, we are strangers in this land. If good comes to it, let us have our share. But if bad comes to it, let it go to the owners of the land who know which gods to appease. So Lagos is part of Nigeria. The Umwafia people are part of Nigeria, but they see themselves as strangers in this part of Nigeria. And they have no principled objection to corruption. All they want is let the consequences of corruption go to the owners of the land. So the whole ethic, Nigerians speak about, uh, I remember as a young person, whenever a head of state visited a state, the elders will read an address and they will ask for their fair share of the national cake. So from the very moment of the foundation of this troubled space we call Nigeria, we saw Nigeria as a cake, as our mala, a bowl of our mala, which we had to eat. Nobody saw this as something that we had to produce, as a nation we had to produce. Nobody said, let us bake a cake. We assumed that the cake was already baked, and we had to get our share, or perhaps even an inordinate share of that cake. And so we have eaten our country to stupor and to extinction and to a crisis. So part of why I said that we need an emergency interim government is that we need to begin to address these questions of vision, of ideology, of ethic, how do we envision Nigeria? How do we envision it? Why is it that in some countries, people are willing to die for their country? How many people are willing to die for Nigeria? And the people who are least willing to die for Nigeria are its leaders. When you have leaders who have no stake in the country, their children don't go to school in that country, they themselves will never permit themselves to be treated in a Nigerian hospital if they are sick or for their families to be treated in a Nigerian hospital if they are sick. They will never take a vacation in their country. So it goes to the question that Informa raised, the question of security. I was just in Nigeria in April for a month, in fact, five weeks. And I stayed in Anambra, my home state, for more than that, you know, for most of that time. Nigerians who lived in Abuja, who lived in Port Harcourt, who lived in uh, Abuja, were calling me and saying, are you not afraid? 
And I said to them, why should I be afraid to be in my hometown? Shouldn't it be the safest place for me to ever be? Okay? So when I go to my hometown, I walk around. I walk on foot. I go to any place I want. If I want, I, I, I get in a keke and, and ride around. But people see this as some kind of eccentricity, some kind of extreme danger. And I'm saying when you inhabit a space, when you come from a place and as a citizen of that place, you are seen as taking an unusual risk in visiting that space. How do you expect a foreign investor to come in? Okay, it doesn't make sense. And you come, you also raise the question of electricity, former. So we have a country where Obasan just spent $16 billion. Okay, and he promised Nigerians that he was with the Lee Elimoke Committee, that he was guaranteeing them regular uninterrupted power supply at the end of 20, 2001. Okay, on several occasions in an interview, Obasanjo was asked, are you sure of this commitment? He said, yes, I promised Nigerians on my honor that from uh, basically January 1, 2002, they would enjoy regular uninterrupted power. Lee Elimoke did not say anything about this until about a month to the deadline. Then he granted an interview where he said that they were taxed with producing 4,000 megawatts, not regular uninterrupted power, which Obasanjo had been speaking about. Subsequently, Obasanjo reaffirmed that he meant regular uninterrupted power. December 31st came. There was almost nationwide blackout. So as if Obasanjo and Lee Elimoke wanted to tell us, we have fooled you guys, okay? We have duped you Nigerians. And then Obasanjo, what did he do? Instead of telling Lee Elimoke that he had failed, he turned around and gave him and member, members of his committee national honors. And he said they had broken the world record in moving electricity generation from 2,000 megawatts to 4,000 megawatts. Who was there to measure that megawatt? So this was a game that Obasanjo came up with to steal Nigeria's resources, let's be blunt. Okay? And then subsequently, when Yaradua took over, there was uh, an investigation by the House of Reps. And they went to places where Obasanjo's government had said that they commissioned the power project and not even a single grain of sand had been moved. And they had paid fully for this project. Obasanjo is walking around today and people see him as a hero. So a few days ago, he said, Nigerian youth should not wait anymore. They should seize this moment and people are clapping. How come Obasanjo did not remember that? How many young people did Obasanjo promote politically when he was president? And he was an imperial president who could put people in places and who ensured that whichever state or office his party wanted, they seized in a do or die affair. And so the whole idea of making electricity an exclusive federal list in the constitution is nonsensical. There are states that are capable of doing independent power projects. But to do this, if you did a power project and you generated electricity, you have to feed it to the national grid. And the government in Abuja will then decide, let's say, River State produces electricity. They fit into the uh, grid. They power, PHN, uh, power holding company of Nigeria could decide to send that power to Zampara State. You have no recall. You know? So Nigeria is a place that doesn't make sense on so many levels. And that's why I say that the whole idea of holding an election for a space that is nonsensical fundamentally is, is a mistake because Nigerians will continue to renew their hope. Oh, you know, if we put in Pito be our, our lives will be better. No, your lives will not be better. Marginally, yes. Okay? Marginally, yes. Maybe Obi will end up building some roads. Maybe he will increase uh, electricity supply from two hours a, 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 in a day in some places to two and a half hours. But that's not where sh we should be. We need a kind of vision of the leader of Dubai who says, I want, I'm in a hurry 
and that I want my country to have all the things that a modern society ought to have. So um, let me go to, um, yeah, so Femi, you talked about Mandela's statement. Nigeria should be leading Africa. When Nigeria earns respect, indeed, the black person in the world will be respected. We are everywhere. And the, the, the irony is that when you encounter Nigerians around the world, you know, so I live in the state of Connecticut, okay? And the best neurosurgeon in Connecticut is, is a Nigerian. And so years ago, that's about five years ago, I, we have friends uh, and the woman needed this surgery and her doctor told her that the best neurosurgeon to do the surgery was this Nigerian guy. But the Nigerian was booked up for more than a year. And this woman told me the story. I said, he happens to be my friend. That I called him and he said to me, tell her to call my secretary and to tell my secretary that I said to add her on the calendar. And when this happened, the woman, a white woman, started crying. She couldn't believe her law. This Nigerian doctor was the highest paid civil servant in the state of Connecticut, more paid than the governor by far, more paid than anybody in this state by far, right? And, you know, so you go in any area, you go to literature, you go to, uh, to writing. Chimamanda is one of the most highly regarded writers in the world today, okay? Um, and we have, of course, the venerable Walesha Inca. We had Achebe, you know, so many high school students have read Achebe and so on. So how come the country that has produced all this talent mocks around with people who cannot produce their secondary school, school, school certificates to be president? How come? Why do we farm out our most important public offices to mediocrities and to dunces and to thieves? Why do we do that? Um, so, um, to go again to, um, I think it's uh, the, um, who was it? There's, there's a gentleman, Village Athletics. Has he left? Yeah, he's gone, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, Village Athletics. Say, do I agree that the easiest thing to do is to criticize? It could be the easiest thing to do if you are just doing criticism. But there's something like informed, enlightened criticism. There are people who criticize because, oh, you know, um, they are Igbo and the person in office is Yoruba, so I just hate the Yoruba, or vice versa. Okay, but there are people who have a certain attuned insight into issues and so on. So we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough of that kind of criticism. And the idea that we can have a distillation of ideas without the critical faculty is false. Critical faculty is key to the distillation of ideas that ultimately fuel development in society. Um, I don't know if there's a question that I missed. Um, yeah. So, yeah, about money. Again, if I'm you raise the question of money, it's, it's a crisis. So we have a country where we borrow money, we borrow to pay our debt, okay? We borrow now to pay salaries, and people are talking about elections. And yet, Nigerians look around, we borrow so much. And remember, it was only a few years ago that we received all this huge uh, debt relief suddenly we borrowed so much more and nobody sees the evidence that that borrowed money was used for anything. But Nigerians are caught paying it. And nobody is saying, stop the presses. Let's find out how this money was spent. Let's find out who stole that money. Let's insist that these people go to jail. So unless you have a country where there is real rule of law, where Nobody is too big, and Obasanjo should not be too big to go to jail. Babangida should not be too big to go to jail. Okay? Nobody should be too big to go to jail. But in Nigeria, even if you become a local government chairman, people can't fathom. People can't imagine you going to jail. And if you go to jail at all, I mean, 
we, we, we they, 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 I remember years ago, Ibori um, was in office. I wrote a cr cr critical column about Ibori, and one a professor who was working for him uh, wrote a rejoinder where he said that Ibori had totally transformed Delta State. The same Ibori, when the EFCC arrested him, said, oh, I need to be given my password to go abroad for medical treatment. I said, if you've totally transformed Delta State, why not seek medical treatment in the state that you have totally transformed? Why are you going abroad for medical treatment? But people don't ask this question, you see, and we need to start asking those questions. All right. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. How, how long do you have with us? Do you I have... have one, one of the things that I have today is time. Okay. Okay. I, I usually don't have time, but today. Good. Have Good. Time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, what I will say, I will get um, people who have not um, had the opportunity to, to ask any questions to do so. And then we are going to, again, ask people who, uh, if your question has been taken care of, you can leave, give room for new people to join. We have a lot of people who are posting their questions on the comment section. And, um, okay, Neka, Ness, go ahead. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, Mr. Adibe, thank you so and much. Ndibe, Ndibe. Ndibe, oh, thank you, Ndibe, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, you brought out so many things, you answered so many questions, and uh, some of the things that you said, I've echoed it in this uh, platform in our previous uh, um, uh, discussions. Because one of the things that you're saying, if I'm getting it right, and I'm sure that I'm really getting it right, is that when you look at Nigeria, human beings, or we all in Nigeria, really needs to change our mindset. And when you said that, you said it in so many different ways. Uh, you made a mention of the professor that went to Nigeria to teach. And then the, uh, whoever didn't allow him, uh, giving him time to uh, to knock on in his office and was kind of berating him. And I saw so many people on this on this platform right now when you were speaking on that. Everybody, so many people were nodding their head. But I threw the challenge because, and I'm included in it. Whenever you're speaking on something like that, some people are nodding their head. But when we are actually put in that position, we replicate the same thing. Mm. And that's what I mean by this mindset. And, and uh, Dr. Davidges will agree with me because I have personally spoken to him about this. Uh, my own mindset changed from 1986 when I became a Buddhist. You have to always look at yourself. And remembering my grandmother practicing paganism, it says, mm -hmm. So what I just said in Igbo language is, when you're pointing one finger to someone, the four fingers you're pointing towards yourself. And that brings us back again to mindset. We need to change our mindset, the way we do things. We, and again, you did mention about we respecting ourselves. We haven't been able to do that. You also said uh, we are sending our best to a different country. We are doing both ways. Some of us that we are here, we have acquired that knowledge. We want to go back and share the same thing with uh, people in Nigeria. But again, due to um, not, us not having light, if some of us want to come back to Nigeria and start a clinical, a full-fledged clinical, you bring back this equipment, they will all blow up because there's no light. That's one thing. And then, so, and when you discuss even with your fellow Nigerians that you see here in the United States, you know, I really want to go back to Nigeria, the first thing that will come out of their mouth, oh, you will be killed. Okay, you will be killed. I could be killed anyway, anyway. Mm -hmm. I could be killed here in New Jersey anytime. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't think, and I really, I really, I keep on saying uh, that we have to give uh, something a try. And I always said that 
the lotus flower grows from the mud. Nigeria, where I'm looking at it right now, is so muddy. But I truly believe that the lotus flower is going to grow from it one day. And so that's why I keep saying our mindset. You were absolutely right when you said that we should first of all deal with the constitution. What is it that we want in Nigeria? But the way that things is right now, for me, I'm going to continue to send my Daimoko to Obi and his running mate, hoping that let's start from there to begin to probably with all our efforts, continue to support him because he's actually going into the presidency with nothing. And so we all need to support from our own little way. And I don't want anybody to feel like, well, I'm not in power, so there's nothing that I can do. There is something that all of us can do as a human being. Then the last thing, before I give somebody a chance to speak on, is that Femi said that leadership doesn't just fall from the Iroko tree. It starts from somewhere. And what did he mean by that? In my own analysis, what he was saying is that we need to raise our kids to know right and wrong. And if they have that integrity, when they get to become a leader, they will always remember that integrity. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Because when people were saying Buhari, 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 I said, well, Buhari doesn't have five heads to, re to rule Nigeria. We are all in this mess together. So we shouldn't single Buhari out. I don't know him, but at the same time, I feel like each and every one of us are contributing what is happening to Nigeria in so many ways, but we are not looking at it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Neka. Thank you so much. Uh, Emeka Onyagwa, um, I know I want to introduce you because you work with OK uh, on the podcast. And um, I don't know if you have a comment or you want to talk about the podcast before we go to um, Jude. And, and please, we, we still have a lot of questions that people are sending through uh, the comment sections. And we still want few people here who have had the chance to talk to Kate, so please give room for some people to come in um, uh, to, to be able to interact with Okay, All right, go ahead, uh, Emeka. You have you have to unmute yourself, Emeka. You're, you're a, you, you haven't muted. You haven't unmuted yourself. Emeka, you run a podcast. You should be. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh my gosh. Okay, America cannot do it. Okay, Jude, go ahead. We we'll figure out what's oh, going on. Oh, okay, all right, sorry. I think okay. I, I hear me now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hear me now. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay. sorry. Uh -huh. I was trying to work on stuff for this weekend, uh, this week. So if you guys can hear me, that's great. Um yeah. uh, I think it's great. Uh people uh, have a platform to uh just come out there and passionately talk about the way they feel about Nigeria, I think it's fantastic. Um, so kudos to Dr. Damages for that. And kudos to every other person doing um, that. It's better than doing something uh, very negative. You just come in, talk, and people might learn something. And you know, you can feel that passion. Um, but overall, I think it's fantastic. It's something similar to um, what we do um, in terms of the podcast. And yes, I'm here to also talk about our podcast. Um, I think um, for those of you who don't know, OK particularly has been chased around Nigeria a little bit. Um, every time he has to go to Nigeria, he has to be careful because the DSS have a habit of um, having a conversation with him that lasts a couple of days. For those that don't, <laughs> I don't know. So the same way it happened with his, with his column as well, um, it was very difficult to uh, put out the column out there. Um, even when it was on Sarah Reporters, it wasn't really a Sarah Reporters column. It was actually, I think, I believe for the Guardian, if I'm not wrong. It was the Guardian uh, initially, and then for the Sun newspaper. There we go. So um, he has a tough time, just like a lot of people who genuinely um, want to speak out and speak up for people who don't have a voice. So that's what we do. And that's essentially what Dr. Damage Rudolph is doing out here. 
So you know, it's 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 we could we could throw it back and forth. I I don't think um, in terms of this segment we have something in particular um, you'd like me to, to to give my opinion on. But overall, I think it's just we're all talking about it, we're all taking a look at it, and people are hopeful. Um, and I think it's it's spectacular. I think it's great that people are hopeful, but there's also a level of realism that needs to be attached to that hopefulness. Um, what can happen under the current system that we have, um, and that's those, those are the conversations. We, that, that's that's those are the conversations we we need to have. Um, but like I said, the unbridled, um, you know, power and uh, passion and. Uh, this thing, even though a lot of us are not living in Nigeria, I always have to prefix that because I, I call it the yo man, the cowboys, and the in it, the T people come in and start telling people, oh, you know, in America, and yada, 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 whatever. You know, <laughs> this is not the reality on the ground and what people are facing. Um, it's a very different circumstance. I was also in Nigeria uh, eight days, of, the same period, okay, was in. Nigeria as well. I was supposed to even go to uh, Amabia in Oke's hometown. I had my mom would not let me stay in Ugo. So, so my, my mom kicked me out of the house at 6 a.m. in the morning on Monday. Uh, uh, I think it was Monday. The, 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 my flight was um, uh, 12.20. My mom kicked me out by 6 a.m. So scared and so... You know, to, to, to mothers, uh, this thing, no matter what it is, the mother's love. You know, so you, you have so much, the same way OK feels, the same way a lot of people are like, ah, even people in Enugu, and even me, uh, I, I'm from Enugu, and even me sitting down in Enugu, like, I didn't feel that way. And even when I asked them questions, when I asked my mother questions, um, I didn't get the answer of impending doom like cut off your head and all that stuff i didn't get that but she didn't want that for me like get out so i'd sleep at the airport for like five hours uh mm -hmm. prior to my flight by the way and that day mind you it was about i think roughly about 10 12 flights to lagos this was a monday mind you sit at home order um it was at least i think eight flights to at least abuja i didn't count the other flights to other places um i know they have like some problems with european airways internationally and all that stuff but the point is, you had a lot of um, flights. I, 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 I counted two private jets leaving Enugu that day, by the way, um, FYI. I don't know who they were for, but I, I saw two private jets in Enugu that day as well. So, um, you know, it's all that conversation. We all sit down. Uh, we all should conversate. We all should be self-aware. We don't, some of us, most of us don't live in the country. Um, it's easy to say all these superlatives oh you know in this country yeah, but we don't live there so the different reality people have to face um a very simple thing that because i always say i'm a history person one of my favorite his history people is uh, dan carlin uh that's uh, dan and c-a-l-i-n in case you want to ever look for him he does hardcore history so i always take up his quotes even though he has a history degree he'll tell you he's not a historian um you know he would he would talk about a lot of things. Sometimes it gets them right, sometimes it gets them wrong. But one key point about Nigeria is um, a deliberate thing was that they took out history, any kind of history teaching in Nigeria. So we don't, for the last, and this is not current or the last 10, this is something that has gone on for the last 50 um, years plus prior to the British even leaving the country. So you have a situation where you have a whole bunch of people who don't know where they are from, who don't know where they are, but they think they know where they are going to. So it's kind of, to me, this is just my own, you know, it's kind of a bizarre way of interacting with people. Um, you don't know where you're from. You don't know, you think, you know, you're Igbo or Yoruba. I'm not even Yoruba. A lot of times I can tell you Yoruba people more about their culture than I can, than that they can rather. Um, and it's just mostly from being somebody that grew up in Lagos and also studied history. Um, but you sh there's no excuse, ex excuse for that. So I say, I say all this to say that in our conversations, we need to have a level of um, um, balance and self-awareness of where we all are and where we are coming from and where we, we want to be. So um, that's what I'll say for now, I'm all sure. Right. All right, thank you, Emeka, thank you so much.
agree. Okay, Jude, what's your comment or question for Ken? Yeah, good morning, everybody, and uh, good afternoon, depending wherever you are. Good evening. Um, well, my, mine is more of a comment than question. I just have a few things to comment. Um, yeah, we see many of us uh, that are abroad, or many Nigerians are abroad uh, that are doing very, very well, uh, which otherwise, if they had been in Nigeria, would have probably um, most of those talent that they are exhibiting now in their various uh, countries or domicile, they would have not had that opportunity uh, because Nigeria is a country that uh, kills and suppresses um, the talent of its citizens instead of giving them a good environment to try. Uh, and uh, also Nigeria, um, I wouldn't say that Nigeria is sending out its best, no. Well, uh, Nigeria is rather pushing out people who, who would have otherwise been her best. Uh, because I, uh, myself, for instance, who is here in the United States, I studied in the University of Nigeria and Soka, and I read graphic design. I knew many students who were in school at my time, very bright students, both those in medicine, those in all, in all departments, very bright students, better than me. And most of them are still languishing in Nigeria. Most of them are driving, uh, driving Okada. Both of those people, and imagine if those people are given the opportunity or had the opportunity I had to travel America, uh, America or travel any part of the world, they would, have, they would still be the people that would be shining. So there are so many languages, so many talents in Nigeria that are being killed, that are being suppressed, that instead of the government of Nigeria providing you know, environment for this talent to thrive, for these people to actualize their God-given potential. Nigeria is the, the government of Nigeria has deliberately been sub been, been been subjugating them, been suppressing them, been annihilating them. It's just a shame. It's so sad when I look at it each time. I you know I have to think about this. Okay. Another point. Sometime a few a few days ago or some time ago, Obasanjo was making a was on the national debate trying to let people know about the um, national speech, uh, making a speech and was saying uh, why he regretted choosing a article as his uh, running mate. It was the, best, the, the worst error he has ever made. And talked about how United States here wrote a memo or something to Nigeria about the people they have listed to investigate uh, in fraudulent practices of stealing Nigerians' money and so on and so forth. And I think who his second man was one of those people on that list. Now, guess you guys, guess what Obasanjo did? Obasanjo said, in all consciousness, I would not allow my second to be investigated. But other people were investigated. Now, the big question is, is Obasanjo lawyer to Nigerian or lawyer to his cronies? And this is the attitude of almost every Nigerian that has brought us to where we are today. Many of us are so selfish, egocentric, we don't care about Nigeria, we don't care about the next people. All we care about is our own, ours, myself, and the people that will support me to steal the, the national, the Nigerian goods. That is the problem, we, one of the major problems we have. And until we, until we get out from this idea of uh, um, sectionalism, um, um, what I call a, a feel good syndrome, a situation where you know that your brother or your sister is not going to perform if he's elected in that position, but because it's your brother or your sister, you go ahead and, and, and elect him. Until we get out of it, we will not go, we're not going anywhere. Even if Obi comes there, hopefully he will, I pray. But majority of the people that are working with him now that are going to occupy various positions, many of them, their, their brothers and sisters are already lining up and already telling them, look, follow Obio when you get to this place. Make sure you get me there. This is the problem we have. This is the problem. Until we begin to think national, we begin to be nationalistic in our thinking and we begin to consider even in, apart from being in leadership, even in our little corners, begin to consider the other human being, your fellow Nigerians as human being. And if you see whatever way you can do to uplift that individual, whether it's your brother or sister, go ahead and do it until we begin to have this attitude. Man, we're not going anywhere. Okay, we're not going and look at look at our electricity we talk about, for instance. Obasanjo spent billions and billions 
you know, in, in providing, you know, that's promised electricity. What, what do we have in return? Darkness. Billions of dollars. We have darkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have darkness. Yeah. All, all that sort of, yes. Sorry, Dude, round been, yeah, round up. Let me round mm -hmm. up. All that subsequent no. of Africa have already spent billions and billions of dollars also in electricity. But what do we have in return? Darkness. The reason because, because of corruption and then this idea of people wanting to not 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 being loyal to their to their country rather they are loyal to themselves and their cronies we just have to get out of this attitude may god help us thank you mm -hmm. okay okay you can respond to okay some. um <clears throat> yeah so thank you very much uh those of you who have asked questions or made comments uh neka um i absolutely agree with you we need um both a uh, change of mindset and also to look inward, which is a very critical uh, point that you, you made, right? One of the things I find most intriguing is that when I encounter Nigerians, uh, they are quite uh, eloquent and voluble about the crisis, the problems in the country. Um, but then quickly you recognize that too many of them are waiting around as um as you just said for their turn to eat you know um i remember uh, as i said in 2001 2002 my wife and i were full full bright scholars at the university of lagos and i wanted to uh instantiate for my students how to act in an ethical and principled way. So on one occasion, I was uh, driving a car that belonged to my father-in-law uh, to a meeting at uh, a business day. I was gonna meet the publisher of business day. I wrote a column for him uh, for a little break, uh, bit. And the police stopped me in, uh, in, uh, at the um, Osho the bus stop and uh, there, there were four policemen, and they accused me of <laughs> operating a car that was stolen. So I told them that the car wasn't stolen, that it belonged to my father-in-law. And how they determined it was stolen was that they checked the, uh, what the, the VIN number of the car, which in Nigeria, in most countries, is electric, um, electronically generated. In Nigeria, all those numbers and letters were handwritten. So the letter three, the number three was missing. So they said, ah, the number three is not here, so it's stolen. So I said, no, it's, you know, I was sure it wasn't stolen. But they kept me there for an hour and 40 minutes, going back and forth. Each police officer will come and tell me that if they took me to the station, I'll be, I'll be so beaten up that my mother would not recognize me. And I said to them that uh, at, at worst, that I was a suspect in a robbery. I said, you have no right to beat me up. And I said, and, and so I told them, if you believe that I stole this car, it's actually your duty. I insist that you take me to the station. On one occasion, one Igbo officer came to talk to me, and I spoke to him in Igbo. And in Igbo, I said to him, you know I didn't steal this car. And he said to me, ah, this is not an Igbo matter, you know. And uh, so we went back and forth. And finally, the Igbo guy came back and said, okay, started speaking to me in Igbo and said, hey, you know, in Igbo, what can you give us and so that we can let you go? So I told him I didn't want to speak Igbo with him anymore. I said, I'm not going to give you shishi. I said, you can take me to the station. And finally, their boss came in and said to me, uh, did you say this car belonged to your father-in-law? I said, yes. He said, uh, does your wife have children for you? I said, yes. He said, how many? I said, three. He said, ah, today, so you have three children. I said, yes. He said, ah, so this thing, they switch you well, well. Um, so started to joke. After an hour and 40 minutes, so I turned around and I said to him, do you have children? He said, oh, yeah, I have 10. I said, so the thing, they switch you too. And he said, ah, yeah, I like the thing well, well. You know, I said, good for you. So he said to me, okay, since uh, your father-in-law, you know, gave you a wife and your wife has children for you, uh, Shebi won't pay you if you spend money uh, for a car that belongs to your father-in-law. So I said to him, but I don't have to spend the money. I said, is either I stole this car or I didn't. And if I didn't steal the car, I'm not going to give you money 
And I, I said, if I stole the car, it's your duty to take me to the station. And he said to me, so where did you say you were going? I was wearing shorts. I said, I told you an hour and 40 minutes ago that I was going to a meeting at Business Day newspaper. And he said, you the one can go meeting. I said, yes. I said, I was teaching at Unilag. I said I, I, that I was wearing shorts to teach, that I wear shorts to weddings, that I wear shorts to church. He said, you the wear shorts go meeting? I said, yes. So he called the other ones and said, ah, this one, he had no correct, making the go. So the next day in class, I told my students, my Unilag students, a story. And all of them said, ah, so you for settle them now. I said, why? They said, oh, don't you see that they delayed you? So I said to them, have you, don't you recognize how warped this situation is? Police officers stop you, accuse you of stealing a car, then you reward them by giving them money. I said, my position will be, if you beg me for money, if I felt like it, I'll give it to you. But you cannot accuse me of being a thief, and then I'll reward you by giving you money. And so uh, the point that Neka made is appropriate. I always tell people that I want to live up to the standards that I profess in my columns. So I don't take a bribe. I've, I've, I've written about every major politician in Nigeria. And some of the things that people don't even understand is that Obasanjo, I was close to Obasanjo before he became president. He actually came to my traditional wedding in Lagos. So if I wanted money, Obasanjo knew, in fact, Obasanjo uh, saw my father-in-law in Abuja on one occasion and said to my father-in-law that your son-in-law okay, has never written one good thing about me. So I was in Lagos and my father-in-law told me this. So I said to him, when next you see Obasanjo, tell him that when he does one good thing, I'll write about it. And my father-in-law had a great sense of humor. He laughed and laughed. This was Professor Bab Sapunwa. Um, but for me, when I took the role of a writer, of a social critic, and a social critic who wanted to insist on certain moral and ethical standards, I knew that I could not be found impeachable. So that if any politician could say, hey, I've given OK in the Bay money, um, then I would lack the moral authority to speak on corruption. And so I would be a millionaire in every currency that counts if I wanted to be on the take. But if I'm going to write and I'm going to condemn corruption, I better ensure that nobody could expose me as a hypocrite. Okay? But you find uh, on so many levels, you find people, which again, which is why in 2010, the Yaradua government put my name on a list of enemies of the state. Um, Yaradua's people had actually written to me. Uh, Yaradua was coming to address the United Nations. And one of his spokesmen wrote to me and said, oh, the president is a big fan of yours and he would like to meet you in New York to explain his vision uh, about Nigeria to you. And I wrote back. I, so he said that Yaradua considered me a critical stakeholder. That was the term. So I wrote back to him. I said, there's nothing called a critical stakeholder. I said, every Nigerian has an equal stake in Nigeria. And I said that Yaradua himself had ag agreed that the election that produced him was fraudulent, even though he claimed that it was fraudulent, that he would have still won in a free and fair election, which for me made me more angry than ever. Because if I am friends with Rudolph, so if I know that if I ask Rudolph for $100, he will give it to me. I should not go to Rudolph's uh, wallet and steal $100. And when Rudolph says, okay, why did you steal my money? I say, ah, because I knew you would have given it to me if I had asked you. So I decided to steal it. So if Yaradua knew that he would have won in a free and fair election, and he knew that Obasanjo wanted to steal the elections for him, he should have insisted on grounds of principle that he wanted a free and fair election. That would be a way of respecting Nigerians. So anyway, so I told the spokesman that Yaradua should renounce his mandate, present himself to Nigerians for a real election, and that 
he would then explain his vision to all Nigerians, not to me. He didn't owe me that explanation. But so many Nigerians in my position, having been invited to meet the president in New York, would have gone. Perhaps what he would have offered is, ah, what would it take? Well, you know, to make you happy, here is some money. But I'm fortunate to have been brought up by parents who really drilled, in, drilled it in all of their children that your name should be impeccable always, okay? So, and because my parents gave us all their children, all five of their children, that training, my parents did not expect me, nor do my siblings expect me to give them ill-gotten money, okay? So I, I don't have the pressure to submit myself to the kind of inducement that Nigerian politicians offer to some journalists and so on. Um, so I agree with you, Jude, that Nigeria has amazing talent. So in a lot of ways, we misspeak when we say that all the best of Nigeria's talent is abroad. The country still has amazing talent. As you rightly said, those talents are suppressed. So those of them who are in Nigeria, it's, it's, it's actually heart-rending. And Rudolph, I know that you and I have talked about it. The people we knew who were some of the best that we encountered in school. And you go to Nigeria and you see the lives they lead. I mean, there is an extraordinary intellectual figure that I don't want to name, that I encountered in my days at The Guardian. This man was one of the best intellectuals of his generation. But by the time he died, people had to hand him money for his family to feed. So that's the kind of maliciousness, the kind of cruelty that Nigeria inflicts on its productive, most productive citizens, potentially productive at, at any rate. So um, it's, it's for us, you know, as, as you said again, Jude, there are people who are now lining up, uh, who know Obi or who know one of the other candidates and saying, hey, you know, if they win, I will get something. Not if they win, I have a talent to lend to Nigeria. I have a contribution to make in order to transform Nigeria into a better space. It's, I'm going to make something. And the country is bankrupt, financially bankrupt. We're borrowing to pay our debts and we're borrowing to pay salaries. You can't get more miserable as a nation than that. All right. Um, thank you, Okay. Uh, what, what I'm going to do now, there are some people who posted some quest questions on, on the chat. I, I can't get to all of them because um, they keep going up and down, but I, I have a few that I want to get to. And then I'll give other people who are here, if you have any follow-up questions based on what okay said, uh, you may have an opportunity to, to do that. But, but before we do that, let me let me just find my the, the ones I picked up on. Uh, okay, this one is from uh, SMPJ18. He said, uh, Prof, I argue that Nigeria does not send its brightest minds out of Nigeria, but chases them out. I think the, the difference, noting the difference is important in this conversation. So that's, that's what, um, what he said. Then there is one from, um, this one is from, let me see. Hold I on. think that's the point that Jude made, actually. Yeah. Okay. This yeah. one is from Ijoma. Ijoma said, Prof, uh, okay, in the bay, my question is this. How can the incoming president implement a system that can practice multi-professional team in the government? Um, that's from Ijoma. And then there's this one from, uh, okay, um, that's from uh, Ovier. Ovier is here now. Ovier, you can clarify. I think you had an issue with the way he answered yes. your question. So, with your view, go ahead. Yes, so my question was, I said, in any given society, it is easy, the easiest thing to do is to criticize, and the mm -hmm. second easiest thing to do is to protest. I wish anybody can do that, but will you agree with me that inability for me and you to come together and organize oh, yes. is... Okay. Okay. Is the probe is what we fail to do, all we are yes. failing to do. Yes. And second, to my friend the, the Dickland, if I hope I get your name right, you made a very good observation about our country and how the, the intellectual and everybody have been the country, which is great. 
But one problem that we have in our country as Nigeria is that inability for us to follow simple rules. The rules here says that ask your question or make your comments and leave. But I don't know. We are still here. <laughs> okay, okay. 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 If, let me. If you, let, yeah, the, 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 the point you made, you know, in fact, I saw you, I think you wrote the question. Yeah, I agree that um, too many times we let, whether it's ethnic or religious or some kind of cultural difference, to separate us, that there is constant mutual suspicion between different groups that Nigeria has what could be wealth, okay? We have multiplicity of cultures within the space called Nigeria. But what's happened is that in borrowing what the British did, this idea of divide and rule, that those who have ruined Nigeria have divided us as well. So I know that in the Obasanjo years, right? Or in the Yaradua years and in the, at the presidency, that there, was a mom, there were moments when labor decided to call a strike to protest uh, something that was worthy of being protested. But quickly, you know, some elements, if Obasanjo was there, you know, some Yoruba elements would say, oh, you know, they are trying to remove a Yoruba president. And so they will pull out. And so ultimately this action will fail. Or sometimes the students who would then bifurcate themselves along ethnic or religious lines. Um, so, yes, we need those of us who are enlightened. And I, as I, again, I've, I've said before that I consider myself a particularly fortunate, grounded Nigerian. I was born in Yola. My parents lived in Yola when I was born. I went to school in Lagos and in Enugu. I worked in Lagos and married to uh, a beautiful Yoruba uh, American woman. And, uh, and, and I'm an American as well. So um, some of the uh, easy ethnic lines that we draw are totally nonsensical to me. Um, and I, I tell people, I remember some years ago, uh, Chuba Okadibo, Okadibo was Senate president and he spent 37 million Naira doing a Christmas party. Chuba Okadibo, Okadibo was a friend of mine, but I wrote a column savaging that, what he did. And I remember that an Igbo friend uh, called me from Maryland, the state of Maryland in the U.S., and was angry. He said, you're attacking a fellow Igbo. So I said to him, I said a simple question. I said, Chuba Okadibo is spending more than the annual salary of the U.S. president to do a Christmas party. I said, is that acceptable to you because he's Igbo? And I said, are your parents wealthy? He said, no. I said, let's have a situation where your mother ran into Chuba Akadibo at an event and asked Chuba Akadibo for 5,000 naira. I said, well, do you think Chuba will give it to your mom because she's Igbo? He said, I don't think so. I said, then why do you defend an Igbo man doing something that is just reprehensible? So we have to stop that nonsense, okay? So a lot of Nigerians, again, we are very situational in our ethics. It's like we hear somebody has stolen funds, public funds, and we say, okay, I won't get angry until I find out whether it's an Igbo man or a Yoruba man or an Afik man. So if it is somebody from outside of your ethnicity, then you walk up your moral outrage. If it is somebody who is from your ethnicity, you say, oh, he's not the first person who stole. So we begin to rationalize impunity you know so i agree with you uh village athletics <laughs> you know that we have to find ways we have to defy those who want to de de separate us and walk across class lines ethnic lines state lines religious lines and and to achieve the country of our dream and by the way as i said in my interview with rudolph even if we believe in separation into Oduduwa land, into Biafra land, into Ejo land as nationalities. Trust me, we're going to have to work to achieve that space. We're not going to have a good country because we have balkanized ourselves. Yeah. Okay. You have more to say, but let me, let me just Thank defend you. our people here, uh, these people, everybody here. 
Um, I'm the one that said that people should leave, volunteer to leave. I'm the one that let people in. People like you, I let you in because I monitor what's going on. So we have in spots. If we have space, like now we have spots for one. So I'm not going to worry anybody here to leave when I know that anybody who wants to join can join. But when I think the studio is full and there's no room, I, I will just, so it's not, it's intentional. I mean, my goal is to, I, I like people to be here and be part of this conversation. But also I want to make sure that if there is, um, if people are trying to get in, that they can get in. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, can I please okay. say something, please? Uh, uh, hold hold I, on. Okay, I, I see Judah and Neka. I I'll come to you guys and uh, let's let me just, just join us. Hold on, hold on, okay. Um, okay, he he's gone. All right, go ahead, uh, Neka. Uh, let me give space now. Thank you. Okay. Thank oh, you, you, can, you can stay. We have one spot open. No, he's so. saying you can stay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But if there's no spot, uh, if if we had have ten people here, then I will ask someone to leave. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Right. Please also, uh, I want to comment on um, uh, Alora's uh, speech uh, because when Alora wanted to uh, respond initially before he came back in, he said, um, uh, can we do constructive criticism in a positive and a wrong way? Um, I, I just want to make sure that Alora, that you really understood what Professor O.K. was saying when he enlightened us about obese campaign. Because the thing with human beings is that, please, sometimes we're hearing stuff, but we're not really analyzing what that individual is trying to say. Criticism is a very good thing. It's a very, very good thing, depending on the content. And uh, for the Igbos that are here, and I'm going to translate this uh, proverb in English because I'm an Igbo woman and I love to use my proverbs, which I also found very prevalent as a Buddhist. Osadebe, may his soul rest in peace, said in, an, in a, a wedding ceremony. Uh, for the, for the uh, bride, he said, we look at when you dig a car gone because now when you dig a car gone, a mali febo kologe you make a change here. What that means in English is that you have to listen to when somebody criticizes you, because if you listen carefully, there might be some good things mm -hmm. that you will take from that criticism and really build yourself up. Mm -hmm. Don't just get upset when somebody criticizes you. Criticism comes in different forms. It could be out of jealousy, it could be out of um, arrogance, it could be out of many things. But still, you who is being criticized, please pick up the good points in it. What Professor Kate said about OB not talking too much and using the mic so much, I think in this platform I've had that before, but at the same time, what his followers or the people working very close with Obi will do now is really to control that mic so that he's not going to say anything that will jeopardize exactly what he's trying to do. Not that he's hiding anything, but nobody is 100% perfect. Mm -hmm. We always have to be uh be liberal and open our mind to learn from everybody just like your parent you can't say because you're a parent you are not going to listen to your child your child can say something that will make sense to you mm -hmm. you're not going to say because you're a phd holder and you see somebody who is homeless and they're saying something and you say what what is it that this person know you are you don't know anything whatever that person is saying could really help you to reform yourself. And that's just what I wanted. I just wanted Alora to understand yeah. that what you said was not like you're criticizing or being in a wrong way. But these are some of his faults that he can mm -hmm. go in and literally try to reform so that he will emerge a better human being. That's Amen.
All right, so thank you. Rudolph, 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 I, I, so I have to reply. Okay, okay Rudolph, by the way, yeah, Alero will come to you, but, but I have about roughly 15 minutes I, and I have a family obligation. So, so I, okay. I, I know that I did say I had all the time, but yeah. Um, and, and this team you are looking at, if you leave them, we'll be here for another three, four hours. <laughs> 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 All right. So um, let me make, let me make, let me make it brief. Alero has to respond. I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. First of all, with all due respect, like I started with, every criticism you made for me is positive. By no means, whenever there's something, Ovier knows. Ovier has said worse things. I have no problem with that. <laughs> for everything we see is a chance for us to get better. This is a movement. So I have no problem with that. But, and I want to say this, and I really mean this, anybody out there that has the intention of getting a contract or sharing, please do not follow this movement. Mm -hmm. Don't, we don't need you. I'm 100%, I, it will be at a cost to me. By following him, it's gonna be at a cost. I know what I can offer. If you have mm -hmm. something to offer, come. Mm -hmm. Politics as usual is over. Mm -hmm. If you want to benefit, you think your family will be, get richer in government, we don't need you, don't follow. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you said the best, Nigerians have the best in everything. Engineering, medical, you have people in the hometown you live in in the States. But have you ever considered that Nigeria also has the best politicians and one, that, one in who or be is? There's a, even in all the evil in our politics, he is also the greatest mind. And your suggestion of an interim government, if we have a one positive mind that we see in a leader that might be able to bring, like you said, these positive minds across the board to help rule his government, to bring us to this, even a beginning, because this is the destruction of decades. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see magic in four years mm -hmm. just to get us on a starting point to start fighting. Mm -hmm. For us to now give it to an interim government, excuse my language, is a bunch of people that will now come, will be infused by the APC and PDP, and now they will be more of a mastermind to destroy us at a faster pace than what we're dealing with. I think we don't want to go back. This man wants to lead. He doesn't want to be president of Nigeria. Don't, don't make that mistake. All right. He's All right. a chance to, to give. Okay, I'm going to cut it short. I'll let yeah, you go to that 15 minutes. Thank you. I want to give everybody a chance to say something. One minute, everybody. Sam and then Jude, and then i come back to you over here. Sam. Um, once again, thank you, Prof. Ndibe. Um, I would like to bring you a little bit home. Obviously, we're talking of Anambra State this time. So let's just, uh, just, can you know? Mm -hmm. So just, just talk it that way. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> talking of Anambra State, obviously, you must have read uh, Professor Soludo's inaugural speech with what he says there, the vision he espoused, and then uh, what is on ground, and the, the way he's fighting on all fronts, you know, no more, you know, all those, you know, all those, you know, all those everything i mean you are in the he's in the news now you know so what is your take just an assessment and then what do you project because we have to trade on hope because nigeria is very 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 you know thank you all right thank you jude yeah i saw in the comment section when somebody was saying all this uh all this we know them what you know what's way what are we going to do now um i want to say to that person and to the larger uh our larger audience and to everybody every nigerian what you want oh, there are so many things we as an individuals can do number one let us shun corruption let us not only shunning corruption let us let us begin to reprove those who are who we know that they're engaging in it it is evil it doesn't lead any nation to anywhere other than its doom. Okay, you can do this in so many ways. For instance, stop giving money to your lecturers to pass you on an exam if you're a student. 
If you are working on the road, you are in a bus, and uh, all this uh, um, Agberu, government Agberu in police uniform stops you and begin to do, uh, demand money from the bus driver, stop encouraging the drug driver, Beth, settle and now, settle and now, and take us away from here. Oh. These are part of the ways. I lived in Lagos for years, practicing, having my own business, prior before I came to America. I have never one day given to any policeman any money on a traffic. I have been taken to a police station severally in Lagos. And guess what? I am the one that always suggests it to them. I don't want you to delay me here. If you think I've committed any offense, take me to your station. And I will drive them with my car to their station. And I will, they'll keep me there for hours. But at the end of the day, they will release me and I will not give them any time. They only wasted my time. But it has been on record that I never give them money. I have All been delayed right. several times. So that is that is some of the ways we can do what we can do on our own to stop corruption. And finally, let me just say this in a minute, in a second. This issue of uh, um, identity politics, okay? Let us shun it. It is killing us. Let us shun it, please. Let us elect uh, the best, and and also believe that we still have credible Nigerians who can who have not soiled their hands. Let us seek out them and elect them. And uh, by the time we do this, I believe we will go a long way. All right, thank you. Uh, Declan, you have something to say, question or final comment? No, no, nothing for me. Okay, Emeka. Uh, can you guys hear me? All right, cool. Um, first things first, let me just say hi to Declan. I think I saw him for the first time uh, at the last time in 2016 during the uh, um, uh, Sahara Reporters Party in New York. Yeah. I, I don't know if he still remembers that, but anyway. Um, uh, uh, just be, just be. So, um, these, com like I said before, these conversations are ongoing day to day. We won't keep talking about them. Um, and a platform like yours, Dr. Um, uh, Rudolph, I think it's great. And as a lot of other platforms are great. Um, but you know, we got to keep having that conversation, having a sense of self awareness. Um, in terms of where we are, where we are from, where we are, go where we might be going to. I know a lot of us are like overseas, and we're like, yeah, it's all great, and the different versions of that. But that's not the conversation. But um, we should we should put that in and understand where that is, where we are, where we are coming from, again, and where we're, where we might be going to. So um, with that in mind, I would always say kindly. Uh, take a look at uh, OK's articles on this thing. It's the safest place to put them on right now, online, uh, Substack. Uh, OK has a very, very lovely history with the DSS. <laughs> the <Dep> <laughs> <Niger> <laughs> They're like his girlfriends, that, that <laughs> nasty breakup. <laughs> you know, so yeah. so uh, we could go into that. That's a whole, multi not even just one episode. So take a look at that. Um, also, the podcast. So it's called, by the way, Offside Musings Podcast, uh, which uh, Mecca Onyagwa is my co-host. Um, we, we try and do it every week. Uh, we're actually trying to do more than once a week uh, as we come closer to the elections. And my focus, our focus, is to reach the young people because it's, it's an anomaly that a country that is almost 65 percent uh, youthful demographic uh, is led by Neanderthals you know so so we want that to change quickly and we are speaking to the youths my dream is that we reclaim something of the NSAS the energy of the NSAS movement um, and uh, so I'm seeing some interesting consciousness by young people and the podcast Offside Museums podcast which comes out uh, between Mon uh, Sunday and Monday every week, um, but you can find it at any time uh, by going to so many different platforms. Uh, so that's why you can follow uh, the conversations, this kind of conversations in an extended way uh, with, with Emeka and me. Yeah, there we go. So um, suggestions, uh, anything, um, if you, anything you want, just pop mm -hmm. it up. We are on the major ones. Obviously, um, Spotify, Apple, um, you name it. Substack is where the this thing is on. So if you can subscribe, check it out. Um, that's the safest place. 
I mean, in the future, definitely we'll try and obviously put OK's articles back on in the some of those, some of those yeah. papers. But this is the safest place to be at because um, it, it's rough out there, man. It's rough out there. All right. <laughs> it's rough out there. So, uh, Rudolph, there you go. All right, thank you. thank you so much, Erica. Thank you. Um, two more comments, or uh, three, and then we are we're done. Um, I think I, there's King Richard who just I, joined. I King Richard, uh, and, and then there is Zaki. And Zaki, uh, Zaki, there, yeah. there are new people that joined us. But um, let me hear uh, Obie say say your last word before I go to King Richard. I'm coming to you, King Richard. Okay. Yeah. I have a short question for Prof and uh, observation to me to allow you, Prof. Do you? believe or do you think that an average Nigerian understand the kind of party politics that we are practicing in Nigeria? The kind, of, politics, you, the kind of what politics? The kind of uh, party politics or the okay. kind of democracy that we are practicing mm -hmm. instead of going we are running in Nigeria. Do you believe an average Nigerian understand the intro to it? Then uh, Alor, to build a nation has nothing to do with your stellar ideas or or your policies. But ability for you to reach a compromise with pretty much everybody, that is what is going to bring the progress that the obedience wants. So if you say make people wait, no one collect contract come. I don't know how you will save you the country. <laughs> so now give and take. You have to be put a give and take. If not, you are not going anywhere. Thank you. That's my observation today. All right. Comfort with positive intentions. All right. Uh, all right. Let's go to Zaki. Zaki, welcome to the show. Um, one minute. We are running now. We are closing. We've done uh, three 90 minutes. It should be one, but we did three of them today. <laughs> Go ahead, exactly. One minute. Just a comment or question for K. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me. I've been listening from the sideline and uh, I appreciate uh, Mr. Okay and the rest of the crews. Um, Ovia just asked. Uh, the question just now that's very very important the doctor actually understand the kind of politics we are running these days in nigeria you understand and uh, i heard him saying something about if we can overcome our ethnic age that is exactly remember i kept saying this on this show we in the diaspora we often seems to be viewing politics from how it should be but not how it is on the ground. Nigeria doesn't want to hear that. We know that we have a lot of good people, saints, popes in diaspora. But how do you tackle that on the grassroots? Please, if you have any other better option, you know, any of you in the house, you can say contribute. That's all I just want to add for now. Anyway, I'll come up later. You know. All right. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, King Richard. Final final comment. I need to help, please. I think I think I have. Can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Rudolph, and thank you, Professor Kane Dibe. My name actually is King Richard Ekwe. Um, I was gonna say that um, we are very fortunate that um, we are alive to witness this time. Prior to this very moment, we have had people say that um, good people, you know, uh, avoid politics because they. Assume it's a dirty game, you know, and um, people who have something to offer, you know, they don't want to get into that fucking water or that dirty water of politics. But here is a time when Nigeria is so destabilized, Nigeria is so bastardized, Nigeria is so messed up that, you know, very decent people wouldn't even have any reason to come in if, it, if you ask me. But here comes a man who, by Nigerian standard, we consider a saint. Yes, uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, Peter Obi now. And uh, th there's no way Peter Obi would have come into this game or into the scene without joining these people. This is the standard they have created. And this is the standard that is available. You know, so to, to participate and to function, he has to join them. Now, having joined them, we should you know, overlook the trivial and petty, you know, uh, 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 blunders or mistakes that he makes, like saying he has a pair of shoes, uh, a, a pair or two of shoes. You know, we should look at, you know, what he has to offer. We should look at his character. We should look at his um, 
principles. You should look at the things he has achieved and overlook so, some of those minor mistakes. Because Yoruba say, Kosibia Dashemani, Tiori Reonimi. That is to say, we hold to Maduge Shigije, Kishie Gara, Ime Ungana. There's no way a man can walk without his head swinging. You understand? Where, where and, and I consider it. Where is the outer version? Where is the outer version? No, no, no. I, I, I don't have the outer version. I, I'm an Igbo man of Igbo parents, born in Accra, Ghana. Yeah. But we came back after the Civil War. But right now, I'm an American citizen. So I, I utilize the, the tools or the skills that I have to pass my message across. I was a journalist in Nigeria before I relocated to the US. So the point I'm trying to make right now is that we should give all it takes to support the only simply sane individual in this game. And we should overlook some of the trivial or petty mistakes or blunders he makes because look, Obi vis-a-vis -vis other individual is like bringing Angel Gabriel in the presence of uh, the many demons in hell. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't even see any means of comparison. I don't, I don't in any way. And okay. this has nothing to do with tribe, nothing whatsoever. So we should give all it takes. Professor Ken Dibe, I know you and you are one of my mentors and I want to advise eh, that you go all the way, all the way, lend your voice so at least we can start somewhere. We cannot have... We, what you suggested from the beginning is impracticable. We know the Nigerian constitution and we know how we can build our government. You know, these people in power right now, they will be happy to hear you and they will create that scenario which you suggested and mess it in further up. It will never happen. Thank you. And God bless right. you, Rudolph, for all you do. <laughs> Thank oh you. God. Thank you so okay, much. So, uh, by, the way, so, uh, by the way, Rudolph, <clears throat> By the way, the issue of uh, what he called blunder on the aspect of Mr. Obi, I don't think that was a blunder. The man said the truth, and they will respect him a lot for that comment, comparing his shoes and where he bought the shoes in the United States. Was it not what he was referring to? Don't even no, go there. No, if, no, don't no, even no, go there. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Don't go there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, because we love Mr. Obi for that anyway. Okay. So okay, let me, let me. Uh, okay, okay, let, no yeah, so, so unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, this has been such a, a an energetic conversation. And I look forward, Rudolph, if you invite me again and we can work out the, a schedule to, to, to be in back mm -hmm. at some point. Okay. Um, so, so many, uh, so many different um, uh, comments and questions. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think it's... Um, uh, Alaro, who says that Obi wants to be a leader, not necessarily a president. Okay. You know, um, I think we should be careful about um, declaring somebody to be a saint. Okay. I think we should be extremely careful about it because uh, Obi is far from being a saint. Okay, um, I'm, I'm willing to go as far as saying that of everybody who is in the space, uh, of the major candidates that will be is, is better than, uh, than the rest of them, right? I'm willing to go that far. And um, part of why OB is exciting for me and for other people is that at least he, he's not one of these politicians who will say, I'm going to move the nation forward, you know, something pat, some, some kind of platitude. Obi talks about uh, particular sectoral problems in, in, in Nigeria and proposes solutions uh, to those. So that's exciting. It's about time we um, engage with that kind of political discourse rather than these brainless fools uh, who just uh, recycle phrases like I want to deliver the dividends of democracy. But as I said, when Obi was governor of Anambra State, um, first of all, I was one of those who, when his election was stolen from him by the PDP and by Ngige, I happened to know Ngige, I didn't know who Obi was, but on grounds of principle, 
I began to write urging Obi never to retreat from his attempts to reclaim his uh, governorship. So I was happy that he stuck it out in court and ultimately in Gige, who was uh, a kind of friend of mine, was removed as he should have been. When Obi took over, so there are certain flaws, and these are not trivial. We better address those flaws because otherwise um, Obi may not learn and he may see those flaws as strengths. One of the times when I was most critical of Obi was when doctors in Anambra State went on strike. They were asking for a kind of minuscule increment in their allowances, which were pretty low. And Obi refused, in a sense, to negotiate with them. And the strike went on for seven or eight months. Okay? That was insensitivity on a scale that we should not call trivial. So I was very, very critical of that. So Obi should be able to, to listen. Okay? The other flaw that Obi has, and uh, something that he exemplified when he was governor, is that he had commissioners, but he centralized governance, so he did not delegate. And I had an occasion to have a personal conversation with him, and I said to him, and by the way, he's like a brother to me. Some of you have seen a video of where he talked about interacting with my mother in church, where my mother asked him to leave the church, right? I'm sure some of you have said that was my mother. Oh, wow. Yeah, so he and my mother, my mother said Obi was now her son, and Obi came to see my mom every Easter, every New Year, every Christmas, and my mom treated him like a son. When my mother died, Obi was mourned with us, with my siblings and me. So I speak as somebody who knows him intimately, but it's my duty to be objective in whatever I say. So I once said to Obi uh, on one occasion, I said, that you don't delegate. People have said to me that you do not delegate. And Obi said to me, well, the part he did not delegate was that if you delegated tasks, that people will start stealing money. And I said to him, then choose those who would not steal. And his response to me is, where do you find them? And I lost it. I was a bit angry. I said, well, <laughs> if you're an honest man, then you should know other honest people. And so where you find them is that you start with those you know. And then you said to them, find me other honest people. And so, and I said to him that if I want to be the governor of a state, but I consider myself the only good person, that everybody is a thief, I said, I would have such profound contempt for that space that I wouldn't want to be the governor. Okay? So it is important that to be, have a broader sense of personnel decisions. So if you have a negative view of people, then you are going to centralize government and nobody knows enough. So if we'll be as president says, everything has to go through me, it's going to be a poor, poor government because he doesn't know nearly enough. Nobody does know enough, not even a, an intellectual genius. Okay. So it's important for him to have that attitude that people can are fundamentally actually good. Okay and that you can find good people, especially if you're a good man, right? So, um, somebody, I think it's uh, CM who asked me a question about Anambra State and, uh, and Soludo. So, Soludo um, gave us a model of uh, an opportunity to see what happens when people are able to exercise their choice in a credible election, right? In the election that produced Soludo, that election was preceded by a televised debate where Andy Oba, the candidate of the APC, showed himself not to belong to that platform. Okay, So there were essentially two candidates. And of the two, I would say that Soludo had an edge. So Soludo is a portrait of the intellectual in government. And so his success is going to also help create a domino effect around Nigeria. Because there's a certain kind of Nigerian suspicion of the cerebral, the intellectual figure. The sort of, sort of Nigerians reduce you to, you just speak grammar, you don't know reality, you don't know real life. So we hope that Soludo succeeds. I think that uh, Soludo was too much of an intellectual and not enough of a, of a pragmatic politician when he 
began to declare that, you know, this sit at home on Mondays was ended and that aboros will be flushed out and so on. What you do as a pragmatic politician is to huddle with your group and to find out practical ways to uh, resolve certain problems. So he paid a price when he made that announcement and then uh, there was an attack on the local government headquarters and one of his commissioners was ultimately beheaded. But I think he's had a grip on the security situation in Anambra State and we're counting on him so Ludo better succeed or it will be bad not only for Anambra State but for any intellectual figure who ultimately uh, proposes himself for political office. I so I am following his, uh, his government um, and again, you see a kind of discrepancy between the intellectual, right? So Toludo had said that uh, anybody who was going to get an appointment in, in, his, in his government had to write uh, a, a letter, so. an application, uh, stating what you were going to offer and so on. And a lot of people wrote that, I understand. And there was a committee that was going to examine all of that. In the end, most of his appointments were by people who had given money, contributed, you know, saying, oh, appoint this person and appoint that person. So the whole idealistic promise to choose the best and the brightest uh, became nullified quickly in the face of the realities of politics. So he had to listen to those who gave him money rather than take this technocratic uh, idealist position. But I think that he should be able ultimately to offer stellar leadership, but it has great impediments. The state has very little money. Uh, Nigeria has very little money. And uh, so, um, which is why we need good leaders, extraordinarily uh, good leaders, because you have to begin to reinvent other ways to raise money. So it's no longer that era when governors will sit, sit down or the president will sit down lazily and every month, the NNPC will show you what they, um, uh, what we have earned from oil revenue, and you can just award contracts and so on. Now you have to be in the business of producing the money that you have to use in doing anything. Uh, Jude's comment um, about uh, people holding themselves to the ideal of, of, of that they, they, to their own ideals, right? So I say to people, sort of a kind of pat rhetorical saying, be the change that you want. Be the change that you want. If you want a corruption-free country, then deny yourself, okay? If you want a better future, then subjugate that desire in yourself for instant gratification, okay? Um, I go home to Nigeria, for example, and people say to me, oh, okay, uh, you haven't built a house in your hometown and you have passed the stage to build a house. And I say to them, no, I haven't reached the stage. Okay? So I don't have a house in my hometown, but my parents gave us values. So my elder brother has a home. I stay in his house when I'm in Nigeria. And we love each other. My siblings, we have such great love, right? Because it's that kind of you are up to the stage to build a house and you don't have the money. So what do you do? You start taking money from politicians who want to bribe you. But once you say to yourself, um, I, have to be, I have to maintain fidelity to certain moral values. I can never, um, the name, the good name that my parents learned to me. You see, Obi met my mother and he said to my mother, here is my card, whatever you want, just you know, tell me and I'll do it for you. And my mother said, no, my five children take care of me. What I want is for you to be a good governor so that everybody will benefit. And Obi said to him, that's what your son said in America because Obi met me in America and that whole conversation, did I want an appointment? Did I want, I said, no, I want, I'm a writer. I want to continue to write without any attachments um, to any form of inducement. So we have to be the change that we want uh, in the country. Somebody asked me, I think it's uh, obvious, whether the average Nigerian understands you know, this democratic process. And the truth is, no, they don't. No, they don't. 
Um, and it goes to the question of political education, which is very low in Nigeria, even amongst people with degrees and so on. So what, are we, what, what must we do? Those of us who know better, those of us who are enlightened, should begin to, should undertake the task of education. All right? I'll tell you something that happened. I was in Nigeria before the last elections, and I was invited by the Rotary Club of Ikoyi and Lagos to speak to them. So I asked the group, I said, who are you going to vote for of the presidential candidates? Half of them said Atiku, half said uh, uh, Buhari. And I said to them, how about uh, Feladro Toye? How about Kinsley Moyalo? And their response was, oh, those don't have the structure. Sort of what is being said of OB today, they don't have the structure. And I said to them, what does structure mean? Because structure ultimately is about those people have not stolen money from Nigeria, so they don't have the money to hand out. So I said to them, all of you have mobile phones, right? They said, yes. I said, and all of you recycle photographs and videos and so on to hundreds of your friends. They said, yes. I said, why don't you write a statement to your circle of friends? I said, make the opening sentence something like, I have decided to vote for Durotoye or Kingsley Morgalo. That's your first sentence. And you say, I'm urging you to make the same commitment because he or Kingsley or whatever is the best candidate. And this is why I consider him the best candidate. And say to your friends, don't make any excuses. Don't tell me they are not going to win. Because if we continue to say that the best candidate is not going to win, we fulfill that prophecy. But if the best candidate doesn't win, but a Buhari gets 30 million votes, but the person you voted for at least got 2 million, then they, he's taken seriously. When there is an election in the country and the Kinsley Moralo gets 30,000 votes all over Nigeria and Buhari gets 30 million and Atiku gets 11 million, it's evidence of a country that is sick to its core. So I said to these members of the Rotary Club, I said to them, if you had a private business to run and Buhari presents himself, Atiku presents himself, and Kinsley Morgalo of Feladro Toye presents himself, I said, would you give an interview to Buhari? They said, no. They wouldn't trust the running of their business to these other two candidates. I said, then why, does it, why is it that when we are talking about the running of a more complex organism, of our country, you will give it to the candidate that you will not trust to run your personal business. So there's something warped about the way we think about our country and about our space. And okay. So, okay, yes. sorry. I, I don't want to interrupt you. I know you're rounding up, but um, I, I want to say something. A lot of comments have been seen, and, and we've been here for more than three hours, uh, yes. getting to four, and we've not mentioned Omoye Lesho, right? And <laughs> oh, I know that... Um, so there's a question that came in now, and it made me think about it. You know, uh, the question was about you worked with Shore, and that Shore believes that everybody else is a thief other than him, and it connects to what you were saying about um, Ob and other things. So, but what do you think about Moyele Shore and his um, presidential run? I, I feel bad that I, I didn't talk about it because, um, yeah. Well, first of all, we don't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just summarize it. Yeah, yeah. just make it. Make okay, it. I think that Showare was best running Sahara reporters. How about that? I think that Showare, um, I think that Showare would do a much better job running Sahara reporters than running a nation. I don't think that Showare has a temperament uh, to run a nation, um, and this is not necessarily a criticism. It's simply, it's the same way. Sometimes people say to me, okay, Ndibe, why don't you go and present yourself as a political candidate? And I say that the gifts that have been given by God and the gifts that I have perhaps shaped are the gifts to be a writer and a teacher. As a politician, running a local government, a, uh, local government, I might make a mess of it. I don't have the temperament to be a politician. Okay, I don't have the temperament to be a senator. I, I will speak good grammar and so on, but some of the willing and dealing I'm not good at. So it's out of self-knowledge that I say I can be, uh, if, if somebody becomes 
president of Nigeria and says to me, okay, they come and be the minister for education, I will not accept. Now, if you set up a great university and you say, come and be a teacher, not the administrator, I'll go teach children there. I'll go teach young students. Okay. So Shawore, I think, is best as a publisher of Sahara Reporters. He has that. Um, uh, he does, that's his temperament, and that's where I see his gifts lying. Um, I will not say we don't have enough time, but I yeah. don't think I don't think that Shore is somebody that I'll vote for as president or that I'll propose as president uh, or local government chairman or senator or any of anything of the sort. Okay, one more last thing before we go, we don't really have to go. If you're watching and please can you like the video? Uh, I was told that Facebook or oh no YouTube has a way of uh, making the videos up so that people can watch it because we spent like four hours here. One mm -hmm. more watch it uh, later. Uh, yeah. Dr. Dominic, I, I, I let you in because I know you've been writing, um, telling me that you are awake, you know, you will have been here. <laughs> and you wanted to see, okay, and say something to okay, you don't have any comments here. Yeah, my, my ancestors woke me up from sleep. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> to come and rub shoulders with the, the likes of uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. David. Yeah, sorry, I just finished, I finished night shift and I didn't walk long oh out. So I was oh, like, I have, sorry, to be, I have to be here. Yes. So it's a privilege to uh, be in the same forum as you are. Um, I haven't listened to, I haven't gone back to listen to much of what you've said, but I sort of, I've kind of heard the ideas that you've espoused, and I know that you're a very, yeah, a, literary, a sound literary man who is passionate about Nigeria. Um, I just want to comment mostly just on the last thing that you said about Shaw, yeah? and I and for me it, it pains me that sometimes we as uh, intellectuals, um, not to be egotistic, we as intellectuals sometimes. Uh, don't realize that we buy into some of the group thinking that is happening in Nigeria, right? I almost see like it, it's interesting how you talk about how people say, "Oh, there is no, there, um, Obi doesn't have structure." But I think, on no end, you use the same um, uh, thinking that you're trying to uh, mm -hmm. on right? Mm -hmm. With, uh, them, right? I think the only criteria for someone who wants to rule a nation as diverse and as messy as Nigeria is the law for Nigeria. That is mm -hmm. what we need. Because if you think through Af African history, African history on those who wanted to make changes and have been undercut by the colonial uh, masters, for lack of a better word, there are people who are radical, who are passionate about, about uh, Africa. Some of them were people who are uh, uh, radicals, but who even you know had to do coups and, and the likes, and military men, right? Mm -hmm. I think the only criteria you need to reach relations with Nigeria is the love for Nigeria and patriotism. Because guess what? We are Ni we are just people living in Nigeria, but there are no two, there are no Nigerians. Because guess what? It's a just it, as far as I'm concerned, without sounding dystopian, Nigeria is a contraption, mm -hmm. not in, in an insulting way. These are you know group of people that are put together to be in one country. But mm -hmm. there's been there has been nothing in the last it, since our independence to bring us together as one mind. And so we are just a, a bond, we are just multi, you know, just multiple nations coexisting in the same space and attempting for many decades to be cohesive with very uh, different uh, mindset and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, um an interest that ends up clashing, right? We have the ethnicity, religion, and all of those things. So I think it's a disservice to us when we uh, put the little man such as Shore, who has been passionate about Nigeria for the last twenty years, and mm. been fighting for us and we think oh because he doesn't have much political clout right that he, he doesn't deserve to be nigerian president let, let me he let me his family. yeah yeah let me because um my family has been waiting Sorry, for mountain so let me yeah. put it this way no i'm not i'm not saying that showere uh cannot be the president of niger because that, it doesn't have structure if showere had all the structure to become president i'm saying that he's not somebody i will propose as president because I don't think that temperamentally that Shore would be a good president. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that, uh, and I worked closely with Shore, right? And that's why I said we don't have enough time, in a sense, to get into this, right? So it has nothing to do with structure. It's just that, from my knowledge of Shore, um, I'm saying that he would not be a good president of Nigeria. He, he, he would be. Uh, he would be good at what he did, which was to run Sahara Reporters. And one is not to minimize this, right? So Sahara Reporters in his heyday held politicians to account. 
unfortunately, it's not doing that right uh, uh, as well this moment, right? And so, and the reason it's not doing well as well as it did in its early days is also a criticism of Shawara, which we could get into. Do you understand? But we don't have the time to get into all of that. And so, if you start a website like Sahara Reporters, which is an amazing, which was in its early days an amazing website, which uh, struck terror in the hearts of politicians. And today, the website no longer commands the kind of attention uh, that it once did. It's a criticism of your leadership, okay? Uh, and if, if you are not able to sustain Sahara Reporters, you can't sustain a more complex organism called a nation. So my coolness to Shoure's presidency has nothing to do with his, his, the absence of structure. I'm actually saying that Shoure, in my view, would not be a good president if he put his attentions and put his effort, he will be a good publisher of Sahara Reporters. Okay. And, 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 and we don't have enough time we for don't have, to, okay, we know, don't so have, that. We, we could spend an hour or two yes. getting into this, but we don't, we don't have the time because my family, I said I would leave at three, okay. is now 324. Okay, okay, yeah, that's, that's, why, that's why I have to stop uh, everything. Mm -hmm. I, I want to just mention that some comments about Declan, you know, some people don't know that if you don't know, he they're, they're, they're saying, why, why is a white man there, right? Yeah, why is he, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sahara. Yeah, yeah. Some people don't know that, and they were complaining, why is the white man here? What is he doing? Is this fine? Yeah. Is this fine or not? <laughs> and do you know we tell you how he chased him around in Lagos? So, so <laughs> for those who do not know that, it's a real Thank, thanks for clarifying that because I'm one of them that said this guy, now, this guy was niche. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Rudolph, you can tell them who they clan. Is. Yeah, he knows your people more than more than uh, some of some of us, you know. Yes. So on that note, uh, okay, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank today. you guys. Yes. Wonderful. Um they clan, uh, you are forgiven. Thank and you. I want, <laughs> and I want to thank you. Thank you so much. I thank want to you, thank everybody you, Jude. Man, uh Emeka, Jude, uh Dr. Dominic, uh King George. I mean, give us the link to Prof uh, uh, podcast. Offside uh, music. Um, so, so if Offside Musings um, podcast and uh, it comes, uh, the column itself comes out on uh, Emeka on the Substack, right? Yeah. So, Rudolph, okay. we're going to send you the links later and okay. so that you can, you can, can put it, it out in the description. So, yeah. Emeka, I don't know if you can write it. Emeka can write it too on the comments. Yeah. For yeah those so, who Emeka, write so, it in the comments. So, Emeka, you can write. Okay. The how to get to the podcast and how to get to my column. So, yeah. so you know, so every week we try and do a podcast and a column together. So, Emeka will uh, provide that information, guys. This has been such an enlivening. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is a win-win. Win-win. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Yes. Thank, you. Yes. Thank, you. Yes. thank you. I'm impressed. Yes. Thank you. And uh, we. My, my, my only Dominic miss. <laughs> so, Dr. Dominic, I'm sorry <laughs> that you came late. You know, yeah, it's yeah. It's a yeah. Listen to you. he's chasing yeah. the dollar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's important. I don't, I don't it? know me. <laughs> Who Declan is? Some of yeah. us that came late, we don't know. Um, oh, uh, Declan. So, um, so uh, Declan actually worked for Sahar Reporters. Oh, okay. Um, so he was he was an editor at Sahar Reporters, and oh. he was. Um, he was a good reason that Sahara Reporter was highly successful in his best days, you know. Mm. So, and he's passionate. Uh, he studied politics under some extraordinary African uh, scholars in New York. And uh, so he's passionate about Nigerian and African politics. And uh, he's currently in Kenya, um, where he's doing great work. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. And uh, see you next week, Wednesdays okay. and on um, Saturdays. And then, of course, we'll so, get the guests. Uh, yeah. So, Emeka, are you able to mm -hmm. put in the information? Rudolph, you have to connect me and uh, uh, Mr. Andive. No yeah, problem. Rudolph, connect us, yeah? Yeah. yeah. No okay. problem. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. <laughs> see you, guys. Right. Okay. Thank Take you. care. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we are frozen. But, uh...